science. As important as the answers are the new and never-ending questions. It is these questions and the researchers who ask them that allow us to advance our knowledge in all fields. Questions that help us understand and tackle global challenges such as climate change. Questions that lead to the discovery of new worlds and to the development of new technologies. Ciências de Lisboa is an epicenter of science of excellence. Let's learn about it together. Welcome. Ciências Research Day 2021. Welcome everyone, welcome to our faculty, Ciências de Lisboa, welcome to our Ciências Research Day 2021. It's a pleasure to have you all here, where the best science is done, for an engaging and profitable session. Today we will talk about scientific achievements and this year's edition will have a session dedicated to climate change an area in which Ciências de Lisboa is leader. Before diving into the scientific program itself, our Dean, Professor Luís Carriço, has a message for you. Good morning. I'm overwhelming, overwhelmed with all these gadgets here, um, but I'll try my best. Uh, Vice Rector, uh, President of our School Council, uh, the uh, representative of the Biological Defense Lab, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, dear students, uh, friends, well, be welcome to uh, the Science Research Day. It is my honor to open this new edition, the third one, with such a great program. Okay. Um, it is also my pleasure to get back to the long-awaited face-to-face edition. Even though uh, the session is being uh, broadcasted on our YouTube cha channel, so for those viewers, guests, reviewers, and voyeurs that are looking at our channel, also be wel welcomed. And uh, I'm pretty sure that you will consider um, the excellence of the science and the research that is done at Ciencias. The program is actually quite amazing. We've selected first a top research, and we are going from fungi to software, to medical images, and to some surprises that I'm go not going to say. Then we talk about the recognition, and finally, Raquel has already said it, we are going to talk about um, climate change. It will be an amazing program. I am pretty sure that you want to listen to it more than you want to listen to me. Okay, it's an uh, incomplete uh, program. I guess if you had three months, we could stay here for three months to listen to all the great science that's done here at Ciencias. Uh, I always have to remember that we are, and we are still, the best research school considering the indicators that the rectorate gives give us in terms of research. And we are keeping that position for still another year. I was talking with one of the previous vice rectors and he also told me another thing. We are the cheapest research in the whole University of Lisbon. You know, for, for someone in my position, that's good, that's great. It's op optimization. Okay, we are going to see a lot about 2020 and the great research that we have done in 2020. Of course, 2020 was a tough year, I would say. And still, 
we managed to do great research. And also classes. I think we also keep the classes running in a very excellent way. It's quite amazing what we do as researchers and teachers. We do a lot of work. Well, um, yesterday I was coming here to try to see what should I say today. And uh, Professor Margarida was bringing some of these plants that you can see here in front of us. I don't know if you have noticed it, but in a way, well, the aim was to represent a little bit, a little a sample of our uh, sustainability uh, living lab. And it does, in fact. But also it, rep it, it represents research. Well, at least part of the research that we do here in, in Ciencias. You see how diverse it is. There's no two alike plants. That's diversity, and that's the research we do here. Each of, each of them has a lot of work, but they work better together. That's collaboration, and that's the kind of research we want to do. Well, you can also see that some of them are struggling for life. Well, that's, you know, that's research. We have to thank that to our, to our government. Um, you know, some of the vases has, have, have, have some holes that we covered with those, with those uh, um, papers. And uh, some of them are quite thirsty. Yeah? Well, I'm not a bot botanist, so I'm just talking because of what I see. And some of the leaves have holes on it that research will somehow cover. And we have to get funded yeah, to bring water to those plants. And still, they are there. So research must be nurtured. We have to do a lot of work to nurture our research, and we have done it so well. So well that we have a vegetable garden over there, which is much bigger than this, with a lot of different plants. And even, or in spite of our funding, we are building a forest. We are creating a forest there. So our research is actually like all these. We are struggling to get funding. We are struggling to give classes in such adverse times. But we are still creating forests. And we are still on the top of the research that is done on the University of Lisbon. And that, that's a lot to say, because you know, University of Lisbon is actually the best research university of this country and is the second best of the Latin American world in so many rankings. So we are quite amazing. So uh, I will stop now and I will just congratulate all the researchers and teachers that uh, enable us to provide you such a great program and let's, let's listen to science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Luis Carrizo. So let's start our CNCA research day. The scientific prov program will be presented by Professor, uh, Margari Professor, Margari Professor Margarida Santos Reis and also our uh, Vice Dean, Professor Pedro Almeida. Professor Margarida Santos Reis is our Vice Dean for Research and the organizer of this event, and Professor Pedro Almeida, our Vice Dean for Image, Communication, and also Institutional Relations. So let's start with uh, Professor Margarida Santos Reis and uh, with the research highlights for this day. So good morning to everyone, and thanks for being here. As our director said, it is uh, this year we are doing something different. So in the first, this is the third edition. In the first edition, we were all here in the room, as you can see. 
Last year it was a challenge, so we, we did it anyway because we think this is a, a, one of the major events in our faculty, and we did it live streaming, and this year we are trying both systems. So thank you for all of you that come here and to listen to us, but also many thanks for those that are listening away far from here, so you are most welcome. As you can imagine, to, to make a presentation that aims to highlight the achievements, scientific achievements of such a diverse school and with, uh, with such developments in, in science, it was very hard. So I'm going to speak of things that I do not understand, fully understand. I, I, today, after three years of being in the direction, of course I understand much more what is done in science in our school, but anyway, I'm not a specialist in all the fields. So forgive me for those that I will not go into in depth, uh, but I will try to do a, a selection of uh, some of the achievements. So let's start with some facts and figures about CNC research, first of all. So for those that still don't know, at the moment we have 19 research units in the Faculty of Science. Of these, 90% are graded as excellent or very good by the international evaluators that evaluate science in Portugal. Most of it are excellent. But who is doing this research? So it's a huge community of researchers. So about 300 persons are academics, so they are professors that also, of course, do teaching, so half of the time is devoted to, to research. But we have almost 100, yes, in 2020, almost 100 researchers that includes from res career researchers to research contracts, postdoc, grantees, etc., etc. So it's a huge community that is doing this uh, research in, in the Faculty of Science. And as uh, Adrieta said, we thank all of them for the excellent research that they allow us to demonstrate to Portugal and to the world. So 2020 was a challenge year because of the pandemics, but still we didn't stop. Of course, we didn't stop to produce science. Some of the work that was planned, field work or lab work could not be done, but we continued with the data that we have and we have been uh, able to uh, work in more than 500 projects. We had published more than 1,000 papers, most of it in Quartil 1, published books, had European individual grants, several collaborative grants also funded by European, and we managed to start more than 500 new protocols, cooperation protocols with enterprise, with scientific institutions abroad in the country, and so on. So it's really a good year in terms of indicators as the previous ones. And who funded our research? So as you can see here, we deal with a lot of money for research. Most of it is still from the national funds, most of it funded by FCT. But comparing with the previous years, and I'm sorry that I didn't put it the previous graphs, I can sh we can see that uh, cap, uh, attracting funds from international sources is becoming, is growing and growing, so we hope in the next year to have at least half of the money, income money for the country, for the faculty coming from international sources. Also, it is important to say that our researchers are recognized uh, not only at the national level, but also at the national level. So, in the last year, it was announced that <coughs> we have 14 scientists in the top 2% of, uh, of the world scientists, quoted, most quoted scientists. And as you can see from the logos, it, this scientist comes from the very different uh, disciplinary areas in the, in the faculty. So we can see people from sci uh, chemical sciences, mathematical sciences, computer sciences, life sciences, earth science, and so on. And also, in, the, in, the, in terms of the University of Lisbon, our, our scientists are also being, our researchers are, being, are also continually being awarded by the prices of scientific prices of the faculty, of the university in this case. So, because of the pandemics, the prizes of the 2019 and 2020 were awarded at the same time. And again, as you can see, we have people, researchers from all the scientific areas of the school. So we, we can say that 
excellence of science in the faculty is transversal to all the scientific areas that we have here, and this is something that we should be proud of. But moving a little bit into the scientific advances that involved science researches in the, in the current years. As you, everyone know, 2019 was a year where COVID almost, uh, I mean, everyone was concerned with COVID and COVID was the topic uh, scientific issue all over the world. And sciences was, of course, in that path. And as you, the ones that existed last year, the, you saw that the thematic session was about uh, an integrated approach of our researchers about the theme of COVID. And um, an important thing that was the investment that sciences has made in creating the Centro de Test Sciences that was related to COVID. And one of the things that we should highlight in this respect is also the program uh, Secure Families which has to do with people that take care of others, that was, uh, I mean, that was um, supported by the presidents of the Republic. And 2020, this continued. And we have several researchers continuing to work on this topic, as because unfortunately we didn't end, again, from different scientific fields. And the major development was the, the, the transition of the Centre de Tests to a much bigger endeavour, which is the Innovation for National Biological Resilience Lab. So this aims to be a center of excellence for co-creation and validation of process for detection, identification, surveillance, and mitigation of new diseases. So this is an endeavor that is co-shared between the Faculty of Science and, and the Army, and also with the support of the Municipality of Lisbon. And the main aim of this is to achieve a high level of response, readiness, and institutional interoperability, contributing to new emerging biological threats. This is already going on. And some of the activities of this are the co development of new generation methods for rapid detection, identification, and risk classification, and also the development of new surveillance and epidemiological assessment procedures. So these are activities that are already ongoing, and I think we should be very, very proud of this initiative, as it is our ambition to be the first integrated surveillance system for continuous assessment for na of national biological risk. Moving a little bit to the selection, or a snapshot of some of the advances that were made during 2020 by our researchers. So, Continuing on the path of the health sciences or research that is linked to the health problems, we have done a, a great improvement in advancing cancer research from bi a biomedical engineer perspective. Here, I cannot say everything that is in the slide because I only have 15 minutes, but here you can see how we have been contributing to the methodological development of image processing for detecting cancer, uh, how to use uh, uh, IT technology to 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 uh, analyze this this issue, and now we use also comp uh, computational simulation studies for uh, therapy. Also, we are undergoing progression patterns in neurodegenerative diseases, namely in this case uh, Alzheimer's diseases and amyotrophic atherosclerosis, which is one of the projects that we highlight. We have many. This one is from Lazige, and we, in this, in this project, we were able to develop a prototype of knowledge discovery uh, through algorithms to reveal biological markers. We are contributing to a personalized medicine, and we are uh, showing how it is important the collaboration between academia and the Portuguese healthcare system. Uh, of course, I'm speaking about sciences researchers in, in, in papers and in projects. I'm not forgetting that in some cases we have collaborations with other institutions, other uh, academic institutions. But here, of course, I'm focusing on our, on our uh, contribution to this process. Another topic with which we are facing a challenge that we are facing today is wildfires. And of course, we have also a lot of uh, uh, a lot of researchers involved in assessing wildfire risk and impacts. Here I'm highlighting, for instance, two cases uh, which uh, are dealing with uh, understanding the 
probability and the risk of it induced high fire in the Mediterranean basis, we are based, but not only, we are concerned with the problems all over the world. And we are also contributing with science uh, to uh, understand what is happening in other countries. This year we have been working, listening about California and we have been listening about Australia, but we cannot forget also what happened in 2020 with Amazonia, where our scientists have contributed a lot to understand what is going and how we can uh, help in the, uh, uh, Amazon. And about impacts, these the same studies allow us to uh, understand how these fires and how droughts, which is associated with fires, influence, for instance, the respiratory diseases in Amazons. So we are really, our science is really, really transferring from pure understanding what is happening to watch what are the impacts of the, of the disease effects. Another challenge for our society is the, the loss of biodiversity. So in 50 years, humans have decimated two-thirds of the world's wildlife. This is a field where our researchers in the, in, in the faculty are working in many research centers, and I could give you dozens of examples of papers that were done in 2020 concerned with biodiversity loss. As I cannot speak of all, I decided to speak about a very important um, thing that we are involved with, which are the red data books, which are conservation tools that document rare and endangered species. And I am like this because the Faculty of Science is coordinating three of the red data books in Portugal, uh, which are the invertebrates, the fishes, and, and the mammals. And these data the red books are, of course, documents that uh, are used by politicians to decide priorities of conservation. But what I want to say here is how important is our contribution with the facts, with the data that we collect in the field about the stats, about the ranges, about demography, and about abundance of the species that allow us to classify and prioritize the species and then allow our government to decide where to invest in terms of supporting biodiversity conservation. Going into the sea, and because I also wanted when preparing this, I wanted to show a diverse, not, not just papers, <laughs> and uh, not just very, um, I mean, I want to, uh, to, um, to show different sides of how we can uh, promote knowledge transfer, for, the, for this, for MARI, I decided to, and for the marine science, I decided to show an important development that was done during 2020s in the frame of a project of, of MARI, one of our research centers, which was, the intention was first to promote open science and open data science, and the second was to uh, promote better, uh, uh, bigger collaboration and call the attention to the research that we do in, 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 in CNCH. So in this case, the example I used is the collaboration that was made with the one of uh, um, big um, high impact research journals, the Frontiers in Marine Science, where researchers from MARE uh, were made an agreement to uh, editorial agreement to publish original research articles, data reports, and reviews about marine science. And at the, to the moment, already 25 articles were published, and of these, 19 were with researchers of uh, sciences. And this, as you can see from this graph, has been viewing for all over the world, so uh, I'm sure that in the next years we will take profit of all the collaborations that can be established by showing outside how good is our science in marine issues. But we are not only concerned with the environment conditions and with the, uh, and plants and animals, we are also involved in studying humans and not only in the, in the perspective of health. We are also uh, doing a lot of research in human evolution. You maybe have seen that, for instance, a very recent news about the Azores and how our researchers contributed to uh, uh, clarifying how Azores was uh, populated uh, in, in recent years. But this is a, a, a subject that is from 2021. So 
from 2020, I showed this example, which has to do with the, the history, the genomic history uh, of humans in Greece, and which was a major contribution of our research to this, to this uh, work. Also, a very important development or advance was the development of a nautical system for space telescope that will X-ray the universe in the next decades. This is a major, major contribution from our Institute of Astrophysics in cooperation with the European Space Agency. And for sure, we will be listening about this in the next years because this is something that will take at least two to three years to be developed. And we have been involved in things that ranges from the design and development of the measurement system to the design of the optical component and the execution of the tests. So our contribution in this field is really, really a major issue. And hopefully next year, some results and some will be uh, um, uh, shown in this session. But we, don't, we do not only do applied science, we also do fundamental science and um, in, in the several fields. In the terms of science, chemical science, and we are concerned with a sustainable world. So I'm, here I'm showing research involving ionic liquids uh, as green solvents for the future. This is a combined experiment and computational approach that allowed the identification of a new family of ionic liquids, which has a major impact, and that it will be is important to, in, to uh, green technologies in areas such as batteries, solar panels, and CO2 capture. So it's also a major development. Also, 2020 was a particular year uh, where advances in scientific uh, in photonics was uh, was was done. We have invited uh, uh, Vladimir Konotop to the to this session. Unfortunately, he could not be here this year, but we could not uh, refer to, uh, the measure conceptual relevance and the application of this research for optics, for physics, and even for mathematics. So it's really important. And lastly, of course, we have also here an uh, excellent research center in history and philosophy of science that has published four volumes that uh, are a current uh, vision of, from the medieval period to the present day that highlights the best historical research in these areas. And we invite you to read chapters that were published in, this, in these books and that involve a, a huge number of researchers from sciences and not only, of course. Okay, so I hope I have translated, uh, I have been able to, to show you a good science, examples of good science, and I could be here, as Audrey has said, much more days speaking about the advances that we have made. But we also have an, an important role in, in the linking to, in, in transferring this knowledge to industry and society. And I selected two examples. One was a, a protocol that was done with Nestle research uh, that has to do with stability of powder-based food products. That, as you know, humidity takes care when this, uh, I mean, it threatens uh, this uh, product, uh, based pro food products. And the uh, researchers from, from CFTC had done a numerical model that uh, w uh, to predict the lifetime of powder-based food products, and as you can imagine, this is a, a huge importance for industry, not only for Nestle, but that could be transferred to many other uh, enterprises that are dealing with these food products. The other thing which is connected a little bit with, um, with uh, our tech labs and uh, with also our ICSI lab is um, the BioLab. The BioLab is also an initiative between the Municipality of Lisbon and the Faculty of Science, and is an open and multidisciplinary innovation ecosystem in the area of biotechnology that aims to promote capacity building, training, experimentation, etc., and develop Lisbon's biocircular economy. And the activities that are ongoing are already multidisciplinary collaborative flagship projects, activities in multiple areas in biotechnology and collaboration with architecture, sustainable fashion and design, but much more things can be done 
at the Fremel Bio Lab. There are two posters outside that you can see if you are interested in this. And I'm sure it's also a big uh, event. And we also do our science, we also transfer our science to public policies. And so, as you probably know, uh, we have been involved in five uh, approved uh, call, um, associate labs that were promoted by FCT. And that's, that involves several centers of the faculty. And, that's to, and they have to do with global changes, with uh, marine sciences, with molecular sciences, uh, with herd sciences. And uh, again, we will, uh, next year, so they were approved at the, at the beginning of 2021. And they are now in the process of being implemented. And we will be listening about their advances in a short time. And I will finalize with the new initiatives to science research. So this directive board had with the, the first task was to show to the faculty and outside the excellent research that we do. Because the faculty was seen as a, 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 a teaching institution and many people did not knew exactly what was done in research in this area, outside his own niche. So our, 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 our first idea was we need to show to everyone what is done to promote collaborations to, to that everyone knows what is done. And now we are going into the next phase. And the next phase is how can we incit incit in promote a stronger collaboration inside sciences community? And how can we give or recognize publicity the good science that is done in, in, in the faculty? So as you saw in the program, today we are going to announce for the first time the prize of research. This is an evolving uh, situation, so we are still maturing about the criteria that should be used to select one person that will represent each year the best science that is produced in Portugal. For this first year, we go into the easiest way, which was <laughs> to look into the productivity. Who published, where it was published, what was the impact of that publications. And I will not say the name now because we are announced in, in a shorter time, but this was already an incentive for people that uh, I'm sure that will uh, like to know that we recognize the good science. Of course, it's just one name. We could listen, we could list a lot of names, but we have to select one, and this is the case. But we have, an, uh, I, we have another initiative that was launched today, which is a call for internal research projects. These, uh, these are exploratory uh, projects that we want to promote yearly as well. And that is a partnership between Faculdad Sciences and pub public, private, or public, private entities. And each edition will have a topic that can go, that can be quite different. It will depend on the partnerships that we are able to establish. And of course, for the first year, we could not select a partnership, a better partnership than with F Sciences, because it's our research is linked with F Sciences. We depend on F Sciences, and we want to acknowledge F Sciences' role in the in the scientific uh, activities of the faculty. So the first edition is uh, uh, supported by F Sciences, so it's shared with F Sciences. And with this first ed edition, we intend to stimulate interdisciplinarity in the context of science and scientific areas. So one of the criteria is that the project that will be submitted need to have at least three members from three scientific areas of the faculty. And with this, we really hope to stimulate collaboration, uh, higher collaboration within the faculty. So those of you that are already thinking that I want to apply, please go and see uh, the, uh, call for, uh, the open call for this edition that was divulged today. And the submissions will be between the 15th of November and the 15th of January. And to finalize today's program, so you know already the program, so we have a session about the top-notch science, another about science and societal organization, 
and then the thematic session that this year is understanding climate change. But please do not forget the poster sessions. Do not forget the speed dates, which are open houses, where you go just pop down and you can speak with researchers, with PhD students, with everyone. And we have also a new initiative, which is the Open Labs, where we will have guided tours to some open labs that are supporting our research. This is us. And coating one of our uh, uh, research units, and I thank them for this. We are driven by excellence. So thank you for listening. So let's continue with the first session. It's again your turn, Professor Margarida Sanchez. The session is Top Notch Science. Okay. So I, I'm going to present the, the first speaker. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to call Alan Phillips. So Alan Phillips is a researcher from BioEasy, one of our research units, and he's also one of the persons that put uh, the University of Lisbon on the, on the rankings, on the top rankings of the world, not only of sciences, because it's one of the highest quote, seated researchers of, uh, of, the, of the world, and he's in the University of Lisbon, and he's in sciences, and he's in one of our research units, and I'm, I'm very proud that he accepted to, be, to, to give a talk today and to speak to all of us. Thank you very much, Alan. Great job. Thank you. Sorry, my glasses messed up with these masks. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, say a few words about what I'm, I'm doing here. Um, I found it very interesting, Professor Cariso, that you used the analogy of forests and trees and everybody working together, because just so happens, I talk about saprose, but this is one of the main things about fungi, one of the most, most important aspects, is forests, trees, everything working together, fungi working with the trees, one of the main functions of fungi in uh, a forest ecosystem, in fact, any ecosystem, is to recycle rubbish. Uh, a lot of stuff falls from trees every year. Um, this has to be recycled. The CO2 has to come back into the atmosphere so the plants can use it for photosynthesis. Um, all the other nutrients in this debris have to be recycled into the soil. This is one of the main things that fungi do. In a forest, and probably just about every uh, plant on earth, uh, fungi form this uh, very intimate relationship, especially with the roots of the, the, the plant. <clears throat> then they send their, um, their hyphae way out, way beyond the root zone filling all the spaces in between the roots in the root zone, drawing in water, transporting it to the tree. And that's why these beautiful cork oak trees in, can survive in absolutely almost bone dry soil in Alentejo in the, in the su summer. It's because the fungi help them get all this water and nutrients. Um, yeah, and without, I, I, it's not an exaggeration. Without fungi, we would not have forests or other plants. Without fungi, I doubt if there could be any, um, any life on Earth. Okay. Uh, fungi are not all good. There are some quite terrible pathogens. Um, some of them cause, uh, or they have caused, famine, mass migrations, uh, even shifts in the economy of entire countries. Um, others just 
lead to food shortages and huge economic losses. <clears throat> okay. I, I work with uh, plant pathogens, nothing like these spectacular ones, but nevertheless, they do cause a lot of problems. One example is this uh, grapevine, dis grapevine decline syndrome. Um, it's a series of uh, diseases, a se series of pathogens, series of diseases contribute to it. The one that I was particularly interested in is the one that causes these, uh, oh, where's my pointer? Okay, anyway, it causes br uh, brown streaks in the xylem. Uh, this is where the xylem has become blocked with fungal hyphae, it's become blocked with tannins and gums. Uh, it, it gradually gets worse as the, the plant gets older, and eventually the grapevines become less and less productive until they have to be uh, replanted. I spent a little bit of time, um, quite a lot of time, isolating fungi from these brown streaks. And these are the three that I came up with most frequently. All in this genus Botryospheria. Where is it? Ah, uh, there it is. Ah, yeah. Three species. This one, uh, very common, but it's a very obscure fungus. At that time, it had only been found on kiwi fruit in New Zealand. Same with uh, this one, Lutea. Whereas the third one is very common, found everywhere, all over the world, on all sorts of different plants. Right. So I thought, let's see. I inoculated some shoots. Um, this parva, but, ah, sorry. This parva, uh, the lesions just kept growing and growing and growing until the, 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 uh, the shoot was dead. The fungus then spread into the, into the canes. Whereas the other two, after a, about a week, the, um, the lesions didn't grow anymore. Uh, so I wasn't too bothered about these other two. And I thought, right, parva is quite a, seems to be quite a problem. But as with all things, everything to do with fungi, there's always a problem because often the taxonomy uh, is in a bit of a mess. This, okay, I won't go into details, but it's basically because fungi were originally classified with plants, so we followed the, all the rules for naming of plants. Finally, it was realized that they're nothing to do with plants whatsoever. So we were based, we were basing our taxonomy on the wrong, wrong type of um, criteria. Okay, just to say that Botryosphere, the whole family Botryosphereaceae was, um, okay, thank you, was a taxonomic chaos, a nightmare. It was really quite difficult to identify a species or to give a species name with any real confidence. So before I published this, I thought, well, this is a very obscure fungus. What are people going to say when I say it's killing grapevines? Um, so, together with the help of a very good friend of mine, uh, he's, he was my first PhD student, uh, first ever, and he's now, well, he's been director of uh, Westerday Institute in Holland for quite a few years. Um, and he gave me free access to all the fungi I want in their enormous culture collection. So I got as many um, fungi, or as many cultures as I thought would be of interest at the time. Um, sequenced the uh, large subunit uh, 28S gene and built this rather crude phylogenetic tree. Not very pretty, uh, but it, it gave some, some ideas. 
No. Parva. Votris viria parva. Votris viria doti dea. In two completely different groups. Uh, this is nonsense. We can't have Votris viria or a genus in two different groups. Uh, so I thought, okay, let's just take the easy option. Let's call this one Neofusicocum, for want of a better name. Um, we introduced a new genus. Okay, not very elegant, um, but it worked. At least now I had got a, a reliable name for this uh, pathogen of grapevines. I could communicate with people. People could communicate with each other. And it was a very reliable name. I'd got all the information, all the details of the fungus, easy to identify. So, this actually worked out quite nicely because um, as time went on after this, within a few years, people were saying, oh, we've got parva here, we've got parva there. Basically, it came down to the fact that this fungus was very, very common on grapevines in all grapevine growing regions of the world. Nice. Not only that, people started to um, elaborate on my rather crude uh, pathogenicity experiments, and it ultimately, now, today, this fungus, which I thought was a very obscure thing, is very common, and it's one of the most important um, fungal pathogens in the grapevine decline syndrome. And this is, um, yeah. So, yeah, just by the simple report of it, uh, giving a good name to, a, to, to the pathogen and um, people could communicate. This is the main thing. Uh, so I was quite happy with that. Even happier when my first Portuguese uh, PhD student found a very interesting diplodia on um, dead and dying, especially dying uh, cork oak trees. It didn't fit in with any other uh, diplodia, so we gave it a, described it as a new species. Um, and soon after, it was found or reported from Sardinia. Um, I spent a, a wonderful week or two with Benedetto in, uh, in Sardinia, and we found that this fungus is actually very widespread. He said he'd seen it before, but didn't pay much notice because he wasn't quite sure what it was. And now he knows, and now he's working on it. In fact, in the um, La Maddalena uh, archipelago, this diplodia is causing great, a lot of damage on the holm oak trees. And it didn't stop there, because um, very soon, uh, Aquila, very good friend of mine from Algeria, her two students were finding it all the way through the oak forests uh, on the north of Algeria. So within a few years, we had got a beautiful collection of this fungus from all around the um, Western Mediterranean. The only place I have not been able to get any cultures is from Morocco. I've had a lot of promises, but nothing. Um, one of Aquila's students, Aladdin, uh, he started, to, he came here for uh, was it a month, I can't remember, uh, and started to do a very nice um, study on genetic variability of this fungus. Unfortunately, as with all these good ideas, uh, funds ran out. Uh, he went back to Algiers, and uh, we still have all the cultures. One day we'll get back to it. Okay, so that was around the Western Mediterranean. This fungus is, is everywhere, and it seems to be causing some problems. 
Over on the other side of the Atlantic, um, reports have been coming in that Diplodia corticola is causing problems on the native oaks throughout the USA. Okay, that was um, very, very quickly just two examples. In the meantime, well, we've had worked with dozens of these things for various different groups of fungi, clearing out what are the pathogens, which ones are the saprophytes, getting good species concepts, or well, good species um, definitions. Uh, this is a bunch of some of the students and researchers that have worked with me. We had a lot of fun. Uh, just going to point out one. This guy, Jaffa Abdolazadeh, we always called him the gentle giant from Iran. Huge guy. He came to work with me for three months, stayed for nine, and ended up, well, probably half, oh, used up half my sequencing budget, but ended up producing or describing so, so many new species from Iran. It was wonderful. Okay, now, even though um, we had some of the species very well characterized, couldn't get away from the fact that the Botryosphereaceae was in chaos. So the time came, we had to just sit down and sort this out. Again, together with my dear friend Pedro Kraus in the Netherlands, um, we got together as many isolates as we could of all the known species in the Botryosphereaceae, or that we thought fitted in there, sequenced five different loci, um, constructed phylogenetic trees, put names to the lineages, and recorded morphological data of all these fungi, all these species. It's, I sit, what, maybe it took 30 seconds to say that. It was an immense job, but the end result was beautiful. We could resolve 17 genera very clearly in the family. Uh, we could resolve 114 species, all clearly, um, clearly demarcated. And we put all this together in a special issue of studies in mycology, fully illustrated um, descriptions of all the species in 17 genera, uh, DNA barcodes, the whole works. And this has been the standard for Botryosphereaceae for ooh, eight years now. So, yeah, not only has that uh, did that clarify all the species, but people found it a lot easier to, to identify them, and this has stimulated so, so many research projects around the world on this family. As I say, it's now time to uh, update this, but uh, it's going, it's moving, but it's slow. As I said, I, just two minutes. Um, my money, my funds ran out. Um, but around about that time, uh, I started to make some nice collaborations. Uh, GAE Yan invited me to, to Beijing for about 10 days. Um, we spent some time working out his research plan for the next five years. And then uh, they uh, asked me to join their advisory board, scientific advisory board. And I said, okay, here's me looking really, as if I realize now just how much work they've given me. So they took me out for hot pot dinner and GA took, took us around, showing us around Beijing, even took us to the Terracotta Warriors in Xi'an. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, this is, this uh, collaboration has worked out really nicely. GA was here uh, of, oh, three years ago with a delegation um, from forestry 
And <clears throat> that's when I joined the, the um, greening of Beijing project. Well, Beijing is it's a, it's a very green city. But their idea is to maintain the, the existing trees um, and monitor their health as carefully as possible. And they've been planting, planting, planting trees in the, in the suburbs. And I help them with disease diagnoses and um, um, disease management. And then two years ago, I spent a very intensive week in Beijing giving lectures, demonstrations, farmers' visits, too many uh, Chinese takeaway lunches, trying to catch up on my own work, but always time for some, uh, some fun. Um, and always, very important, cold beer at the end of the day. Okay, it's led to quite a lot of uh, joint projects, joint, joint everything. And very briefly, this is the last couple of slides. This is one of the collaborations that I most enjoy. Uh, Kevin Hyde uh, invited me to spend three months in his center of excellence at Mei Luang University in Thailand. It was an incredible experience to be surrounded by these Oh, 50 or so PhD students, postdocs, highly motivated, really talented, and work like crazy. And they know how to enjoy life. Smile. <sighs> so many smiles, always, always smiling. Wonderful. Except for this guy in the back. Three months, I never saw him smile. <laughs> okay, he's got a problem. Right, this led to a lot of joint works. Um, I worked extensively with Nalin um, Wujayabadena, uh, and he likes to write big monographs. We, and it's a lot of work, a lot of work compiling, whatever. But they, they worked out nicely. I think we'd, here we'd just finished uh, checking the final draft of one of the papers, and we, we'd had enough. I think this was the evening. Uh, it also led to more monographs together with um, some of my uh, people here in, in Portugal. Um, and the thing that I really enjoy most of all are the, biodiver uh, the diversity studies. We know nothing about the diversity of fungi. There's something like predict or estimated to be 2.2 to 3.8 million species. So far, we know less than 200,000. We've got a long way to go. So I love this work. It also, we set up a website um, dedicated to Botrius virialis. We're, we're populating that at the moment, and it's coming on. Most of all, it's a beautiful campus. Um, Beautiful, excellent food, a yeah, really nice way of life. But back here, I do have just a few students here now. I'm um, Diana, he's do she's doing some wonderful work on um, microfungi on palms. And this links very nicely with another PhD student I have in Algeria, who's also looking at palms in Sahara, and it links with several students in, in Thailand. We've got this really nice linking going on. And the one that's just about to finish was a really nice study on fungi on um, eucalyptus. So to the future, continue to collaborate with China and Thailand. That's where I have to say that's the future of mycology. But I will continue to fight to stimulate research on fungi in Portugal. I didn't manage to do it as much as I wanted to, but I think there are some students coming up who will fulfill my dream. I hope so. So there's not really much else to, to say, so thank you very much for listening. I 
apologize for talking too much as usual. Thanks, Helen, for your presentation. And I'm sure now you will, will be most known inside our community and students will come and join you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the next speaker is Nuno Matella. So today we have announced the first research prize for the faculty, but we have awards for the best teacher for several years now, and Nuno is also winning these prizes. So he really is a good example how we can be a good teacher and a good researcher. And today he's going to speak about research. Thanks, Nuno, for accepting the invitation. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the board of the faculty for organizing these days. Thank you, Professor Margarida, for the invitation. Uh, let me start by, by a, a big disclaimer. So the, the big majority of my results were produced by the students I had the pleasure to supervise during the last few years. And the merit is more from, uh, to them than, than to me. So uh, as you all probably know, breast cancer is the second leading cause of cancer uh, uh, death cancer by, in women, and it's also uh, the most prevalent in women. Because of this, I think it's probably the first disease to have uh, worldwide screening programs since the 60s uh, in the Western world, but nowadays in almost uh, every country. It's also still a very hot topic in research. There are lots of groups investigating new diagnostic tools, new treatment modalities, and as an example, it was the first application of computer-aided diagnostics to medicine. The first software approved to be used to help a doctor deciding the diagnostic was in mammography uh, in the 60s. And with all these efforts, I think the, this community helped to reduce the mortality rates in 40% in the last 25 years. But there is still a lot to do. And we start looking to the path that the patient with cancer normally does. It starts with screening, normally by mammography, tomosynthesis or magnetic resonance, depending on the country. If something suspicious is found in this screening program, the patient uh, goes to a diagnostic uh, procedure, normally with mammography, ultrasound, again, magnetic resonance. If it's confirmed, the patient has a lesion, has to make a biopsy to grade this lesion, and then a staging process to see if the disease is still in the breast or is spreading to the rest of the, the body, and finally, the treatment. We start talking with uh, radiologists, physicians, clinical doctors, trying to find out what were their problems in this, all this process and to see what could we help. And with the expertise in the faculty who was in nuclear medicine, we start looking, uh, the problems were, the first was in the screening. So the big problem in screening is the high recall rates. There are lots of women that are called to make new exams and they don't have, in, in fact, any kind of lesion. Uh, we are not doing risk assessment. We are just repeating exams every two years and we find something, we call them, and we don't have personalized programs, uh, except for people with a, with a genetic risk, risk. We are not doing anything different to women that in fact have different characteristics. In the diagnostic process, the problems were mainly the visualization and how to characterize lesions that were detected in this process. Finally, in grading, then analog, uh, to analyze biopsy, the histology uh, uh, doctors, they have to look to microscope images that are very time consuming. And as I will show you later, it's very, uh, it suffers from humor observer variability. Regarding staging with PETs, the problem is that PET is a whole body image with very low spatial resolution, very poor detection sensitivity. So in some cases, we are not able to really find metastasis uh, in early stage. And regarding treatment, I think the main problem is still the prediction of the treatment output. So we looked at this picture and we decided where are you going to work? And the first point was uh, a few years ago now, it was about staging and pets. And in fact, the faculty entered a big project called ClearPan. And the idea was to develop a dedicated scanner to make this staging process based on pet technology. and. The, project, the idea was something like this. We, had, we aimed to have a, pro, a scanner able to produce images with 1.5 millimeter spatial resolution and that, allowed faster, that could allow faster exams and lower dose to the patients. 
and uh, the idea is to have the patients lie down in decubitus and we have these plates that move around the breast to detect the images. For this, the faculty enter the international collaboration with academic partners, clinical partners, uh, international network collaborations and the industrial partners. And at the end, we were able to produce two scanners, one that is installed in Coimbra, and the second one was firstly in France and then moved to Italy. And our main effort in the faculty was to produce image reconstruction algorithms, the visualization for the software, uh, the software for visualization, and finally to correct physical effects. In fact, the faculty is one of the shareholders of the PETSIS uh, Pepsi's electronics that produces these scanners and produces parts of the scanners that can be sold separately. As an example, you can see a patient that was diagnosed with, diagnosed with breast cancer and after doing this PAM exam, it was possible to characterize better the lesion and to see that in fact the lesion was a multifocal lesion and the treatment that was, uh, uh, that was made after this diagnostic was different based on this, on, on this decision. So, and the project finished, we, say, we look again to the picture and said, where can, we, where can we apply all this expertise that we gain with this project in all this process? And we look to the diagnostic procedure because there was a new technique that was appearing in the field that is called digital breast tomosynthesis. That is also a tomographic images, uh, image modality like PET that use the same kind of mathematics to produce images and decide, let's see what can we do in this field. So the problem is that mammography is just a compression of the breast with all the tissues overlapped and there are lots of false positives because we don't really know if uh, something strange in the breast is not, it, it's a lesion or just uh, overimposing tissues that appear like a lesion in this image. So the idea was, it was in the 2010, 2015, a new technique was appearing called digital breast tomosynthesis that aimed to eliminate this visual overlap. The idea is to have, like in CT or magnetic resonance, to have the breast visualized in slices of one millimeter without this overimposed system. I'll show you a little a short video from one of the manufacturers to show you how it works. It's a machine similar to mammography. That, the only difference is that it acquires different mammography images in different angles, and then it's reconstructed like CT, and we can have a slice by slice visualization. As an example, you can see here the mammography, and you can see here the corresponding tomosynthesis. Let me show you with the mouse. Here in this field, in this point, you can see that in fact there are two lesions appearing here that look like one, only one lesion in this part. Looks fine, but there are there's a new, as all new technologies, there are lots of problems. The big advantage was, in fact, they use the same machine as mammography. The images look the same, so for the, the, the people that have to analyze this image, it was easy to, to transfer to this technology, but the protocol is not clear yet. So clinical doctors still rely on mammography. They still look to a, mam a mammography first, and then if it, they find something suspicious, they will open the digital breast tomosynthesis. It's not, the image reconstruction and image visualization was not optimized. That was good for us. That was our expertise from the previous project. And since it's, we are not acquiring 360 degrees around the breast, we don't have isotropic resolution. So doctors were still looking only to images in this direction. And it's sometimes difficult to understand how different lesions are distributed uh, around the breast. So we start, okay, our expertise was image reconstruction. Let's try to apply similar algorithms to this data. And in fact, we were able with the, uh, uh, funded project by FCT, we were able to develop algorithms for image reconstruction. These ones were the ones that manufacturer installs in the scanner, and you can see here that our, our algorithms were able to increase contrast to noise ratio and, re and better, have better special resolution than the ones that were being shown to the doctors. So we moved from these images to this one. Okay. The doctors told us we were happy with this one. If you could have images similar to this one, but with less dose, that would be fine. And we proved that it was possible to have images with less radiation, but with the same quality with these algorithms. We also worked with post-processing. And then we tried to, there were lots of, one of the problems is noise in these images. So we developed a new algorithm 
it's been quite successful because we are now applying it to other image modalities, uh, that reduces noises. As you can see here, it increases the signal to noise ratio, but it keeps the, the spatial resolution uh, close to the original one. That's one of the problem of filtering. Normally we reduce noise, but we, de we, we degrade spatial resolution. And you can see the images. Um, this is the original one. This is the filtered one. I think it's not easy to see in these kind of screens, but uh, the idea that the radiologists say us is that easy to diagnose with the filter one than with this one. This is the work that Anna Margarita has done before her PhD. And one of the main problems for the doctors was this idea that we are giving too many radiation to the, those of the patients because we are doing too many exams. And as I told you, clinical doctors, uh, doctors still make the first mammography, then they look to the mammography, and they then open the second file that is the digital breast tomosynthesis. But since the two exams are made together, the, radi the, the radiation is already given to the patient. What was the, if, you, if we have all the volume, why can't we just synthesize digitally the mammography that the doctors are used to, to see, only one image? That we have been doing, and in fact, this is the synthesized mammography, and this is the real one obtained with the machine. This is acquired only with the tomosynthesis images, and this was validated with the IPO, Lisbon IPO uh, radiologist, and in fact, they have the same kind of result in the diagnostics if they use this one when compared to when they use this one. And finally, one of the, our biggest results, I think Professor Margarita showed this in her slide, it's the PhD from Mar Margarita Mota. When they decide to open the digital breast tomosynthesis, they normally, to see it slice by slice, they have 60 images at least to see. And in a screening program, you can imagine that it's different to have one image to see or to have 60 images to see when you have people uh, uh, having exams all around uh, the country and the images being sent to Lisbon to someone analyze this. They told us it's very time consuming. I have to look these all 60 images and the only thing that the manufacturer give us is a video where these images are moving up and down. And we said, okay, but why don't you do a volume rendering? You see it's in a 3D uh, way to see all the images, the problem is that we have, uh, we have an isotropic uh, spatial resolution, so every time we rotate this image, we lose quality. And you see here that, in fact, you lose, but we are getting better now because we are using the convolution method, something that our students used to learn in mathematics and they really don't understand why are we learning this uh, in calculus. Um, and now what Margarita is doing at the last stage of her PhD, and I invite you to to, to see her presentation, the, uh, her defense in the beginning of next year, is to apply deep learning techniques to highlight regions of this volume rendering. And we can work like Google Earth. You can uh, zoom in and zoom out of your volume that is rotating and to see uh, what are the regions that must be analyzed carefully. And okay, go back to the, our picture and then we look, okay, we are in the diagnostic process, but what about the screening? The problem with screening is that too many exams, too many false positives. Uh, how can you reduce this? Uh, F? It's, a, it's a cost for the system. We are, we are calling people from uh, Evora, Beja, to come to Lisbon to repeat their exams because in the, when they are doing their exams in a van that goes to their city, they said there's something suspicious that come back to Lisbon and to make this exam. So the first idea is to apply computer-aided diagnostic tools we just, in the beginning, were repeating what everyone was, was doing. Uh, screening was made with mammography, DBT, and MRI. The software for uh, CAD, for computer-assisted diagnosis, was only available for mammography. And then we decided to implement it to DBT. And the idea was to first find in a breast image what are the most suspicious areas and then analyze each of these areas based on their shape, based on their texture, texture and then let's uh, mark them with different colors based on what are, what are the most suspicious ones or the less suspicious ones. Again, this was uh, one of the problems. Other problems that doctors were saying to us that one of the major risk factors is breast density. Women with 
more dense breasts have higher risk of having a cancer. And in fact, women with denser breasts should be making mammography more frequently than women with less dense breasts. In some countries, this uh, dense classification is mandatory and must be written in the mammography reports. And it's made by visual analysis. And of course, there is uh, the very, a big variability between people, especially in borderline cases. So we applied artificial intelligence to this. We get a very big database. We made fuzzy C means clustering, a multi-classification process, and we deployed the software to automatically classify these. So this will be, will start, the validation of this software will be starting next year at Hospital de Luz. We are working with the ethics uh, committee protocol. And the idea is to, we have a problem here, is that we are validating against the idea of that doctors that also have this variability. But um, the idea is that a very simple pipeline of uh, processes at the end, the result will appear here. Our biggest effort at this moment is about risk assessment. This idea that we are not giving all the information that we could give to a woman that goes to a mammography center. And uh, in fact, what doctors, they do these, they just, they open the previous exams and they see the difference. But it's Difficult because sometimes the images were not applied in the same machine, were not applied in the same position, and the differences are very uh, are very low. It's very difficult to to see these differences. So the first idea was first we have to align all these images. So we developed a co-registration algorithm, and we find what the regions that have major differences between different uh, examinations, and then we realize that. It's better to look to the whole breast instead of looking just for a few points. And you start finding uh, metrics that would measure how the breast is changing over the time. And in fact, this is, are not published results yet. Juan is going to present his, his master thesis uh, in the beginning of next year. You can see that for a short database that we have, this is the normal behavior for breast cancer patients, and this appears one or two years before the radiologist detects, detects the cancer. And this is the normal behavior for a healthy patient that this change is re related with aging. So we have to refine this, we have to increase our database because there are different types of breast cancer that have different behaviors in these metrics. And the databases, we don't need a database of, um, of mammograms, that's easy. We need database of history of patients, because we'd like to in introduce here information like age, uh, family history, genetic, uh, genetic information. So this is our ultimate goal for the next few years. Regarding the rest of the picture, there, we also try to do something very short on those two points. I would like to do more. First, in treatment, a few years ago, we had a project with Fundação Chapal because people that were doing chemotherapy to the, to the breasts some of them had some cognitive changes over the years. And the psychologists say that this could be related with the chemotherapy, chemotherapy they have made a few years ago. So the, at that time, we, uh, the project was, the aim was to analyze brain images of people with breast cancer during the treatment. They're already doing PET images to analyze, to make the staging of the breast cancer. And we realized that in some patients, in some kind of treatments, there were changes on the brain due to the chemotherapy. And this could be related with the, the cognitive changes that appear in the future. These two master theses were then developed to a PhD, to a FCT funding project that I think is almost finishing. Finally, regarding grading, we have worked with Ipatimu at Porto, and they told us we have a it's a huge task they have. So to decide which, what kind of treatment the patient was going to do, they have to analyze biopsy. And to, for example, they have to analyze images like this. And they have to count the numbers of black dots and red dots in these images. And depending on the ratio between these two dots, uh, they will decide if the patient is going to be immunotherapy, the treatment is going to be immunotherapy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. And we say, that could be, that's not very difficult. And 
it was more difficult than to imagine because this image is reduced normally as five gigabytes, so it's not easy to process images with five gigabytes. But then at the end, we are able to make a software that automatically counts these dots and gives them a value to validate what they have measured. We are not replacing the histopathologist. We are just helping them with this task of counting dots and an image that sometimes in borderline cases, it's very difficult to get a, uh, to get a decision. So I give, I'll leave you with the big picture. Of course, there's lots of things to do in this field. Um, but the, my final remarks is that, in fact, I think medical imaging is it's helping reducing breast cancer mortality. And by medical engineering, we are, has a, a very important role in this, or with the existing modalities, giving us more information, or creating new technologies that could help us, especially artificial intelligence, data mining, deep learning, it's opening new doors. In fact, whether it last year, we had an exploratory project approved for, approved for next year in this last call, and uh, there's much to do here, so if you, have, if you would like to help us or give us new challenge, you are more than welcome to Ibev, uh, and we could work together with this. I would acknowledge once again all the master and PhD students that I had the pleasure to supervise, and of course, thank uh, Pedro for inspiring us for starting this journey a few years ago. So, thank you all. Thank you, Nunu, for the amazing work. And it's a good example of collaboration between two areas in, in the faculty. Thank you very much. So the next speaker, uh, this is a Michelin uh, session. The next speaker is Alison Bessani from Lazige. He's going to speak about software diversity in dependable systems. Thank you. He's also professor at the Department of Informatics. So thanks for inviting me for this uh, session. Um, the idea here is to present you a bit uh, about the, the role of software diversity in making more secure, trustworthy, resilient systems. And some of the, I just grasped on some of the, ah, uh, I can lose this. I forgot. <laughs> Uh, and I'll give you some of the insights about the work we've been doing uh, regarding this. Um, so what my, my overall idea here is basically to show you the more the, than the problem than the, the solutions. Um, in Lazige we do a lot of work on dependable systems. This is one, only one of these. And this is joint work mainly with Miguel Garcia, which was an ex-PhD student, and Professor Neves. Um, so, when we talk about dependable systems, we are talking here about systems that we can trust with some justification. Not, not, we not trust on them because of we have faith they will work. We trust on them because someone took care to make them trustworthy. A common way to have justifiable trust is to, have, is to use replication. So these days, any important system that we use have some form of replication to make sure that we, it can tolerate failures. Um, and this, in fact, uh, requires a lot of work in the background, okay, because it's, just, it's not just a matter of creating three replicas and sending messages to them. Uh, when we access something, we don't access one, we access, access several. So there's a lot of work on making sure, oh, let me see if this, there's a pointer, oh, no, there's no pointer. Ah, yeah, there it is, but it's not possible to see. Uh, you have to, create, to use protocols to coordinate these replicas in some way, okay? And there's a lot of work on this, both on industry and academia. Uh, but a common thing that you have to, to, to know when you think about fault tolerance is that in any systems you have a threshold of failures that the system can tolerate, okay? For example, here you can have three replicas, but in fact you cannot tolerate the failure of two. You tolerate the failure of just one. Uh, so it depends a lot on the protocol. And also, it depends a lot on the type of failure that you want to tolerate. Typically, people are worried about crash failures. So if the server goes offline, we need to do, uh, the system still continues to work. Why it goes offline doesn't matter. It might be a power failure, might be some defect on the hardware, might be a bug on the software that it hanged, whatever. 
But a more insidious or complicated failure to deal is what we call arbitrary or Byzantine failure. In this case, the server stops behaving in accordance with its specification. Basically, it starts going crazy. It sends wrong messages, it goes against the algorithm, it tries to send wrong results to the user, and, and, and many things like this. Uh, this. This type of failure is interesting because it can model security incidents, in particular intrusions. Because we can imagine that when someone uh, compromises your server, there's an intrusion on the server, it can tr uh, this adversary can try to go against the system, to, to break the, the system and fool the users, and so on. And uh, one thing that happens when you, when you have this, this type of fault tolerance is that you, ha you have these three shoulders I just mentioned. And in all these systems, you have this, uh, this idea or this underlying assumption that you need independent failures. You cannot have a single problem or a single event bringing down the whole system. Otherwise, it's not worth to have to pay the price for fault tolerance. Um, and this idea of independent, fa independent failures, it depends uh, if it's, if it's um, reasonable or not, depends a lot what you are, what, what are the nature of these failures. Are you worried about bad luck or the facts that might or might not happen? Or are you worried about a malicious adversary? Uh, and, and the way you can deal with these two things are quite different. So let's think about the malicious adversary. If you just deploy a system and you use, for example, four replicas, and then there is someone that wants to bring down your system to, or to compromise some replicas to steal money or, I don't know, affect it in a, in a bad way. So this adversary that can be a nation, can be a very wealthy group that has a lot of resources, will spend some time investigating the software and then we'll find a bug. And with the same bug or the same vulnerability, we'll create an exploit and bring down the whole system. Why? Because the system is composed by the same type of software, same type of replicas. A way to deal with that is to strengthen the system using diversity. So basically, you will use different software and even hardware or locations, whatever, on the replicas to make sure that this adversary will need to spend an, an amount of effort um, proportional to the number of replicas to bring it down. So in this case, if, you, if the adversary spends some time to find a single vulnerability, it will be able only to break one of the replicas. This, the exploit, the, the attack, will not work on the others, hopefully. So this, this, what I described here is an assumption that people take, okay? Or in the past it was an assumption. Uh, the, the main problem that we try to address first uh, when we started working on diversity is how to substantiate this, this assumption. How, what people can do to make sure, uh, the, the, in fact, different, uh, an attacker will need different attacks to bring down a replicated service. One of the ways to do that is to build different versions of the, safety, the service. The problem, it's called the N version programming. It's used in military systems, in very, very critical systems like in avionics and so on. But the problem is it's very expensive. So there's always the question that, okay, I want to build a complicated server. Is it better to get my budget and divide it to build several versions, or it's better to get my budget and build one single version that is much more tested and verified? Typically, people build a single version, uh, especially on the online servers that we use on the internet. So um, a better way to do that is to use off-the-shelf diversity, okay? So this is diversity that is already available. So for example, you can try to deploy different operating systems on different servers. Because most of the time, the vulnerabilities come, come not from the service you are deploying, but from software that you install in your server together with the operating system or to support your application. Um, so the first work we, we did was to verify uh, with real data to see if the, using different operating systems will lead you to some uh, improvements in terms of um, independent failures.
okay? And this work was published in 2011, so 10 years ago, and this year it was recognized as was with the Test of Time Award um, in, the, in the most important conference on dependable systems. Um, and I don't have fancy pictures to show about the, the, the work because it's basically a lot of tables and, and graphs, but I can tell you what, what it's about. So basically what we, do, we did, we got a lot of uh, vulnerability reports that was produced by this national vulnerability database. It's uh, uh, an organization from uh, American government. Uh, so thousands of vulnerability reports uh, encompassing 15 years affecting 11 operating systems of four families. Then we conducted several history observed studies to validate uh, common vul vulnerability. If, if I just count vulnerabilities or common vulnerabilities from the past would be a good way to uh, foresee the number of common vulnerabilities that would appear in the future, given a set of operating systems. Um, and this would be some uh, way to see if I can use this kind of information to build a, de or a set of uh, different replicas to, to deploy a critical service. The results here were for most of operating system pairs, there are very few common vulnerabilities. They are mostly on application or services installed with the OS. And uh, we saw that past common vulnerabilities provide good hints about future common vulnerabilities. And in the end, we present strong evidence that using different operating systems can help you to have independent node failures. Um, of course, this is difficult to really assert about this because the data is very imprecise. Operating systems are very complex types of software. But anyway, this was a good thing that, uh, a good thing that we, we, we found that, and many people cited this to ju just show that this, the, the, this is a way to achieve what we need for fault tolerance, to implement fault tolerance. Then, uh, after this work, we continued work on this topic. Uh, we did an extended version of that, that uh, paper with more, even more data. But then we, we tried to think about way, how could we implement like a kind of infrastructure to run a diverse system, okay? And uh, this came from, and then we started thinking about this kind of problem. So imagine uh, my adversary was not able to find one vulnerability with a given time, but he's very resourceful and he spent even more time and then he found two vulnerabilities. Two vulnerabilities in this particular setup will be more than the fault we showed we tolerate. So with this, it can compromise the system. So to deal with this kind of scenario, what we need is some kind of diversity, not only in space, but also in time. We need the system to keep evolving, changing the, the software on the replicas based on the, what we observe in terms of new vulnerabilities and new uh, exploits, new, about, uh, based on what we learn uh, from, from the security advisor uh, organizations, okay? And this is what we did in a second work that took, was published eight years before the, the after that one, sorry. Uh, and uh, in this work, the idea is to, is, is to answer the, the, this question, how to reconfigure the set of replicas in a replicated system. Um, th th there are two main goals here. The first one is to make an attack effort proportional to the number of faults I want to tolerate. This means that the, an attacker, an intelligent adversary with a lot of resource, will need to spend its resource uh, in, a, in a proportional way to the number of replicas I put in the system, which is proportional to the, the, the fault we showed. And the second goal is something that people always ask when we talk about diversity in software systems. is how to make the management of diversity. Because if you talk with anyone that works with man, um, deployment and maintaining systems, uh, they will say, okay, having a single version is already a lot of work. Why you want me to have all these versions and keep changing them and monitoring them? So we need some automatic solution to deal with this. Um, so from the point of view of engineering, building this automatic solution is 
there's a lot of cha challenge there. Uh, and one of the problems here is that we can't find the most secure set of replicas. Measuring security is still an open question and probably to never be answered. But we are, what we can do, and the previous work showed us, was that we can estimate the set of replicas with less common vulnerabilities. So maybe they are not the most secure, but at least if they, someone wants to attack them, they will need to find different ways to enter on each of these replicas. So this work was published in 2019, and by the end of 2019, uh, it, it took Miguel, uh, the PhD student, more than four years to, to develop this system. Um, and it's called Lazarus, and it won the best student paper award in this uh, well-known conference in the field. Um, and th this work deals a lot of problems, and uh, what I want to show you is that basically what, what it does is it, you can deploy the replicated service as usual in virtual machines on top of it, and then what we developed is this Lazarus system that goes in background. It basically uh, deploys VMs with virtual machines with replicas, and then if the, it detects that something is not good, it replaces, it takes out a VM and deploy another one. How it does that? It looks on the, all the information about vulnerabilities and attacks that exists on the internet. Is this OSINT there? Then there's a controller that applies some uh, machine learning and a lot of heuristics to try to see if uh, there's a risk to, be, to have common vulnerabilities on the setup that is running in the system and find the next setup that we should use. There are many minor issues here that, that complicate this, this task. Uh, one of them, for example, is how to assess the, the severity of a vulnerability because to do risk assessment, we basically get all the vulnerabilities that we see and then try to see if they are more, which, or, which one of them are more risky than others, which one of them affects uh, several operating systems, in this case, we are using just operating system, but it could be generalized. The reports that we get from the internet are not very precise, so we need to use clustering algorithms and things like that. And when it's done, we also evaluated this running, okay, running a real service. And another thing that we note and documented in the, in the work is that having this diversity is good for security or for dependability, but it affects the performance a lot because some software is slower, is less efficient than others. But anyway, so there, there must be a, more work here on taking all these things in consideration, and, uh, and certainly we didn't solve the whole problem, but we showed a way to address this problem that is something that everyone recognizes, but there are very few works that really address it. And that's it, thank you. So thank you, Alison, for helping us to be more secure in the future. So now it's time to announce the research prize. So I call first our dean that is going to deliver the prize. As I told you before in my presentation, this is an evolving issue. It's the first time, as, I, as always, we are learning with the process. So the criteria this year was the production, the scientific production based on the publications that were reported in our system. We have a system where we, we are obliged to report our production, so it is based on that, so it's an objective criteria. Um, and the winner this year is someone from the Institute of Astrophysics and uh, Space Sciences. So we, we invite Francisco Lobo to come into the... and we have to clap for his... <laughs> And congratulations. And so we invited Francisco to speak a little bit about uh, the research that he has done and it give us this award. Congratulations. <laughs> so thank you very much. I must say it's a big honor to receive this prize. So thank you once again very, very much. Much appreciated. 
uh, I see many faces in the audience which were my teachers. I was a student here. Yeah? I did my master's here. Yeah? I did my PhD here. Yeah? So um, teachers who are present and are not amongst us. So I have very fond memories of uh, Professor Bergante Gil. He was my teacher in nuclear physics one and two, and he was fantastic. One of the best teachers I ever had. So I think that's one example to, to follow. Sorry about that. Uh, so um, let me just see how this works. Okay, fantastic. It's a pointer. Okay, so uh, like was mentioned, uh, I'm a researcher at the Institute of Space Sciences, uh, of Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And uh, so my research is done within cosmology and gravitation. So it's in that context that, that I'm going to speak uh, to you about my research. I was asked to do, I mean, a kind of a summary of my, of my research. I don't like speaking much about myself. I was going to speak about the IA, the Institute, but uh, I'll give you a brief outline of my research that was done last year. So basically, like I mentioned, it's done within cosmology and gravitation. And uh, let me just put you into context, okay, of what has been done in cosmology and gravitation the last, uh, well, few years. So much, much attention has been uh, given to cosmology and gravitation. As one can see, in the last five years, three Nobel Prizes have, uh, have been given to gravitation and to cosmology. From 2020, uh, we have a, a prize uh, on black holes, okay, so more of a theoretical part by Roger Penrose and also some observational part uh, of this, this big compact supermassive object that exists in the center of our galaxy, which we believe is a, a supermassive black hole. So uh, over about 30 years, uh, those two teams of these, of these people, uh, they, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Gess, they did a, a research and they proved uh, with the orbits of the of these stars, S stars, that uh, without margin of doubt, there is a huge compact object, which we believe is a supermassive black hole. So that is fantastic because um, um, black holes are still not, not very conventional to science, okay? Many people don't like black holes because of all the implications it has. It took Einstein, Einstein never, never accepted black hole uh, solutions. He was always saying that they weren't physical. So it's, it's amazing to see that uh, this, this, this prize was given to black hole physics last year. Uh, in 2019, there was a, the, the Nobel Prize was shared with cosmology, with James Peebles, a uh, fantastic guy. Uh, most of the breakthroughs, uh, he had a part, he had a hand since the 60s, which is amazing. He had a lifetime, 60 years or a, li a lifetime of uh, contributions to cosmology. So it is a very well-deserved pri uh, prize. And let me say that in 2017, there was also a fantastic prize by the first direct attention of gravitational waves, okay? So that is a really a, a, an amazing um, um, observation, okay? Uh, in terms of theory and in terms of technology, okay? It was, given, it was a dream by that guy in, uh, yeah, that guy there, Rhino Wise, Back in the late 60s, he had a dream of making this, this detector, and, um, and 50 years later, they, they detected the first, the first um, gravitational waves. So it's in this context that I do my research, okay? So basically, let me go on into my research. So last year was a very bad year because of the pandemic, right? Um, we, 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 I mean, I think we, we all suffered uh, well because of this. Uh, in terms of research, it was a very productive year for me. Um, I, to maintain my sanity, I, I focused on my research, and it was very uh, productive. So we produced about uh, 24 papers, 22 were published. Uh, one is almost published, one is uh, uh, proceedings, and um, it's in this context that, of the Nobel Prizes, that um, I do my research. So basically, uh, in cosmology, okay, so I do, I do most of my research in modified theories of gravity. So it's uh, extensions of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And I will tell you more about this. Why are the motivations for this? Uh, and when you think about modified theories of gravity, you also think about the foundations of gravitational physics. What are the foundations? What drives us? What are the guidelines we have? So I will also give you some very intuitive ideas about that. Uh, and also a lot of, of the applications of astrophysics and cosmology. Okay. Uh, I also do a lot of research in black hole physics. So there was also, so in that first part, the first part there was about eight papers. 
in this part of the year there was another eight papers. Uh, I'll focus on this bold. Uh, but in terms of black hole physics, uh, there was also a great um, discovery, I mean, um, an image that was uh, well produced well, two years ago. It was the first image of, of a black hole, okay? It was, it was uh, well, produced by the Event Horizon Telescope, which is also an amazing observational uh, feat, okay? And that opened also new, re uh, new branches of research to try to discriminate which are the compact objects which give that image. So it may not be a black hole, okay? It might be something else. So that's, that's also a big area of research within these compact objects, okay? We had a lot of work uh, in that, trying to discover uh, observational signatures of alternative objects. We had about three papers published there. And um, we also discovered some novel, regular black hole solutions, regular in terms that they singularity free. So a black hole is a very, very strange object. Okay? It's got this event horizon where people go in, objects go in, but they cannot go out. And they die in this singularity. So we found some novel solutions that are singularity free. That is really fantastic work, uh, work that's been cited a lot and that was really uh, fantastic to do this work. Uh, we've also done some work with stability issues with these rotation uh, black hole solutions, the, the so-called curl black holes, and also some compact uh, wormhole solutions, novel ones. And uh, also gravitational waves. So we, we had an, uh, a paper with this, this consortium called LISA, which is a consortium that is going to be launched in 2034, a space uh, mission, and it's going to um, detect gravitational waves from huge supermassive black holes and also to explore for the first time the gravitational waves that come from the Big Bang. Okay, so that is really fantastic. For the first time, we'll be able to explore the birth of our universe. That, that is really fantastic. And that's also for the new generation, the students, because it's going to be launched in 2034. So it's more for them. In terms of theory, a lot of technology is involved, so it's that. Okay, so um, as you see, quite a lot of topics, so I, I don't have the physical time to speak uh, about this. So I spoke with, with Margarita, and uh, so I'm going to focus on just these two topics, which is what we do research basically in the cosmology group at the IA. So basically the foundations of gravitational physics, uh, cosmology in, in, the, in the context of modified theories of gravity. So extending Einstein's general theory of relativity. Okay, so when one speaks about modified gravity, is there a need for this new gravitational physics? What, what, what are the motivations? Uh, and when, you, when we speak about gravitational, uh, theory, uh, um, gravitational theories, we also th uh, speak about the foundations. What are the foundations of these gravitational theories? What are the guidelines we have to try to uh, explore extensions of Einstein's theory? Okay, so I will try to give you some intuitive ideas. I'll put in a, a few uh, mathematics for the, the mathematicians, but at least the intuition, uh, I hope, is transmitted to you. Um, so there we are, modified. And I will speak to you about a specific theory that was developed here at the science faculty. It's called the hybrid metric party uh, theory. That's a theory that, was, that we, dis that we um, constructed about 10 years ago and has been given a lot of attention since then. And uh, we had about seven papers also published in this context last year. So it's in the, in the context of a specific theory called the hybrid metric Palatini uh, uh, gravity. I will also try to give you some intuitive ideas about what is it, what motivated us, what's, what, what, what drove us, and also many applications, okay? Okay, so um, we also know that the, when we speak about um, uh, modified gravity, what, modify, uh, what motivates us to go in, into modified theories of gravity? So basically we know that the universe is undergoing a late-time cosmic acceleration, okay? And the cause of this late-time cosmic acceleration is still unknown. People, think, uh, people uh, uh, attribute the cause of this to, to some exotic fluid called dark energy, okay? But uh, one can also explore the alternative point of view and say that maybe Einstein's theory at large scales breaks down, okay? This is what is called uh, extensions of Einstein's theory or modified gravity. So the theory of gravity is Einstein's theory of general relativity. Okay? Modified gravity is just modifications of GR. Okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> and of course the question is, is GR the correct theory of gravity? Um, so the fact that GR is also facing many challenges, it's, uh, for instance, the 
the difficulty of explaining uh, specific observations like the late time cosmic, cosmic acceleration because geology does not explain it. You need some extra terms, okay? You need some extra fluids. Uh, also, the incompatibility of GR with other theories like quantum mechanics. You cannot uh, unify them. Uh, also, the lack of uniqueness. So there's many, many theories that explain exactly the same thing as Einstein's theory, So, which is correct. So we need some guidelines here, which is really difficult to do. Okay, so are all these uh, problems an indication for a need for new gravitational physics? That's, that's the big question that we pose. Okay, so a bit of the, of the mathematics, okay? I'll try to be as intuitive as possible. So we have this, this object called the action, okay? Where we construct the action. This over here is the Ricci scalar. It's constructed in terms, it's, um, it's um, an invariant quantity uh, defined in terms of, of specific fields, which I will tell you about. Here we have the metal Lagrangian. And this object over here will be very important. It's called the metric. So. The metric is, is essentially what people consider as the fundamental field in gravitational physics. So it's what gives you, in a space, it's what gives you the distance between points and, and, uh, and time as measured by clocks. So what gives you those measurements are the metric uh, components. So one question is, is the metric really the fundamental field? Okay, that's a big question, and uh, maybe not. So let me just go on. So um, it's very elegant, it's very useful to work with this Lagrangian formulism, okay? Uh, at the quantum level, so the action may acquire some physical meaning, so this helps us with uh, quantum field theory in the, in the uh, unification of uh, GR, gravitational theory, with quantum mechanics. Um, it's also easier to compare the gravitational theories through the action than by the field equations, because the field equations is what gives us the dynamics of, of, of a system. And these field equations are usually extremely messy, so you can't get much intuition uh, to them. This, this intuition is given through the action, where one can control uh, the terms. It tells us which are the kinetic terms, which are the coupling terms, which are the uh, dynamical terms. So it's a, at, at this level that we gain some intuition about the theory. Okay? So here we have one fundamental field, which I've already given, I've already told you, it's the metric. Okay? So, one can extend this theory because GR, this uh, einstein hilbert Lagrangian, gives you the Einstein field equation, which cannot really account for the late time cosmic acceleration. So we need to take into account uh, extra terms, okay? So the next uh, less complicated theory is what is called F of R gravity. So there's no reason just to consider an, a linear term in R. So let's consider a, a function of R. It's called the, the so-called F of R gravity. That's the, it's the less, most uh, complicated theory uh, after, after GR, okay? So it's, uh, it's quite simple. I won't give you the field equations. I will tell you a bit of the intuition. So now there's several approaches here. So here we are going into the foundations of gravitational theory. First of all, we've seen that there's, that there's uh, one fundamental field, which is the metric, okay? But there's also another field. It's called the connection, uh, which uh, basically intuitively gives you the, uh, the way that a tangent vector changes over a curve, okay? So basically, if you have a curve over a curved space-time, okay, and you take a tangent vector to a part and you, and you transport it parallelly, okay, and you go along the curve, one verifies that in a curved space-time, that tangent vector does not coincide with the initial one, okay? And what quantifies that is a quantity that we give the name as um, the connection. So many people, so in fact, many people uh, will consider that this connection, this field, is the most fundamental field in gravitational theory, okay? So here we have a kind of a contradiction. I mean, which, which, which is the fundamental field? Is it the metric or is it this, this mathematical quantity called the connection, okay? So now we have different approaches. We have the metric approach to the, the gravitational theories. This metric approach, tells you that we have the action, and then we vary the action with respect to the metric. We have the field equations, and you work out all the, all your cosmology, all the, all the dynamics, or all your systems. That is called the metric approach of gravity. The, when you take into account that there's two fundamental fields, the metric and the connection, that is the so-called Palatini approach, which in GR, in Einstein's theory, at the level of the field equations, are exactly the same. 
Einstein was the one that discovered that in the early 20s, but it's called the Palatinian, that's another story, which is quite nice uh, to know. But anyway, so, um, so th there's basically two approaches, the metric formalism and the Palatinian formalism, okay? Now, which is the fundamental one? So at GR, same thing. What about in modified gravity? In modified gravity, when you take the metric and the Palatinian formalism, you get two theories which are completely different. They describe different dynamics, okay? So now we have a kind of a contradiction, which is quite intriguing. And each approach in the metric formalism and the Palatinian formalism have severe drawbacks. I won't go into this. If you want to know, you can speak to me later. But uh, each, each formalism has extremely severe drawbacks, okay? Now, what's, what really motivated us to, to, to think about a different approach uh, was, okay, so both approaches do have uh, uh, positive aspects. They have severe drawbacks. What about if you take into account a hybrid, uh, um, hybrid um, um, approach? Like, say that we have, we have the two fundamental fields, okay? So, so both fields are fundamental because they describe different things, but they're independent. And then you construct your Lagrangian in terms of these different approaches. So we have two terms. One is the metric. One, one is going to describe the metric approach, and one is going to describe the Palatini approach. And what we discovered back in 2012 was really amazing, which motivated us to go into, into this theory, because it solves all the severe drawbacks from the metric uh, formalism and the Palatini formalism, which was fantastic. That was really the eureka moment of this theory. Okay? That was done here at the science faculty of the University of Lisbon with international uh, uh, collaborators. That's, that's led us to go further and to do applications of this theory. A lot of work was done, okay? So um, there was a lot of work. And we also had a, a review that, that was uh, requested last year to do an uh, update of this theory. Um, so much work was done over the years, uh, not just in cosmology. So what we found is that the conditions for the weak field limit were compatible for the large scale structure of the universe. The perimeters were compatible, so that was really fantastic also. But what about the intermediate scale, for instance, uh, at the galaxy level, for instance, dark matter? So we found also that these theories also mimic dark matter. So we don't need dark matter. We need, this theory describes perfectly well with the correct perimeters from weak scales to large scales. So they explain all this dynamics from small to large scales, fantastic. That is really amazing. So a lot of work was done here. Uh, we were asked to, uh, to write a book for uh, Cambridge University Press, and we, we uh, wrote it. Uh, and we were very happy to know that the book was placed in this uh, Cambridge monographs on mathematical physics. That is really a, a great moment for us. So there's a book published on this, if you want to know more about the, uh, the technical aspects. And uh, I will go uh, quite fast now because uh, time is running out. So last year, last year, in this context, we had a lot of applications of this theory. So basically, we had a, we had a paper on um, the stability of, of curved black holes, which, which is extremely messy, but we found some different, some new techniques to, to attack, to, to uh, tackle this uh, stability problem uh, using the, a, a generalized hybrid metric particle theory. So there's also different theories here that you can take into account. Um, we also found some very nice uh, string-like cosmic, uh, string-like um, objects, which are cosmic strings, which were uh, produced in the early universe. So also some, some nice uh, solutions were found here. And we also had this review, which I mentioned last year. And uh, also, we also uh, did some research in brain walls, which is basically uh, tells us that our universe, our four-dimensional universe, is immersed in a fifth dimension called the, the brain wall. Okay, so also very, some nice, very nice solutions were also found here. And we found some nice solutions with structures, okay? Uh, so that, that, that is also very nice to do. And we also found some novel solutions with uh, these uh, wormhole uh, solutions. Okay, so uh, as was mentioned by, by Margarita, uh, all this work was done in the context of institutions, right? It's the science faculty of the University of Lisbon. So this work was nurtured here at the science faculty. Uh, so I won't go into this. Uh, I think Margarita has already spoken about this. But also, I would like to say a few words about my institute, the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences. So also, in that context of, this, of these 2%, we had 10% we had of the researchers with PhDs were also listed in that, in that uh, 
that list of the, of the top 2% of the world scientists. So we have about 68 um, researchers. Uh, seven of them were listed. We have about 40 PhD students, about 20, 25 master students. So, uh, so here the work is also nurtured. Um, we open, we, we uh, create opportunities uh, for, for people to do their research. Uh, all the structure is laid out. We have six groups ranging from uh, small scales, from planets, stars, galaxies, to cosmology, to instrumentation, to uh, science communication, which takes uh, our research into the public, and they have done some, some, some fantastic work. So uh, we are driven by excellence. Uh, so I will also uh, publicize a talk later on by a great researcher of the IA, Pedro Machado, later on. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you. So it seems we are in the path for a Nobel Prize. So hopefully soon we will have a, a Nobel Prize in, in physics. And I forgot to say that Francisco is now the new um, coordinator of the Institute of Astrophysics and, and Space Sciences. So that's all for the, for the morning. And Raquel, do you have something to say? Thank you. Yes, that is time to coffee break. Uh, we meet you again in 20 minutes uh, at midday. Uh, in the, uh, at the room C3 will take place the poster session so um, we will find the posters about cutting-edge science developed at Sciences de Lisboa. Thank you all. We see you again. Uh, see you already here. Thank you. So coffee break is downstairs, sorry. Coffee break is downstairs. We have to go to the to bed.
So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back for this uh, session number two of this uh, CNC Research Day. We'll probably have uh, some more people entering in the meantime, but uh, since we are uh, running a bit late, we are starting now. And uh, this uh, second session deals with science and societal recognition. And uh, um, the first talk is uh, going to be presented by um, Marie Curie Fellow, uh, named Anna de Jesus, coming from the IDL. And I invite Anna to tell us about sulfur and metal, metal fluxes in the oceanic crust. Anna, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning. So thank you all for coming and for the invitation. So I would like to start by acknowledging my supervisor, uh, Mario Gonçalves, and our master student, Diogo Silva, which have been collaborating with me in this work. And uh, although my uh, host institution is IDL, uh, in my Marie Curie, I also have as partners uh, uh, Münster University and uh, the CNRS at Toulouse. And uh, of course, I would also like to acknowledge all these uh, people that work in these institutions with which I collaborate scientifically either by sharing samples or by uh, having some analytical support from their part. So as you saw from the title, I'm going to talk about the cycling or fluxes of metal uh, um, in the oceanic crust, so metals uh, and sulfur. And so we need to establish a little bit of ground here. So here we have a very simplified uh, cross section um, showing what would be the geodynamics uh, um, cycle of sulfur. Oh, I have a screen here. Um, right. Um, and so I'm going to mention a lot the stable isotopes of sulfur. So the most abundant isotopes are uh, sulfur 32 and 34, and we measure them by this ratio uh, in relation to a standard, which is the meteoritic standard. And so that standard for us has a zero per mil value, uh, which is pretty much the same uh, that we would find in the mantle, so plus or less um, one. Any shifts that we find from those values of zero, uh, whether in sediments, volcanic rocks, uh, or whatever, uh, indicates that we had processes that were able to fractionate uh, those isotopes. And so this can be temperature changes, this can be redox changes, pH, or even uh, biologically assisted processes since anaerobic bacteria are able to strongly fractionate sulfur isotopes and uh, actually resulting in the very negative uh, values that you see, for example, here in sedimentary rocks. Um, so sulfur has a, a strong redox potential. It is able both to form uh, re reduced and oxidized species, which I will mention throughout my talk, which are sulfides and sulfates for the uh, oxidized uh, version, and forms ligands with metals. Therefore, it has a very high importance also in economic geology. Um, when we talk about sulfur fluxes, one of the most important inputs uh, comes from mantle degassing. This can happen so in mid-ocean ridges, which I will talk a lot, where the uh, tectonic plates are separating, uh, not represented here, but so in uh, so deep tapping of the mantle, mantle that generates oceanic islands that we are uh, looking every day now in TV um, in the Cumbre Vieja um, volcano, uh, but also in the volcanic arcs that we have in subduction zones. So subduction zones is where the oceanic crust is recycled back into the mantle. And when we look at the signature of uh, the, the volcanic products, gases and rocks that come in these subduction volcanoes, we see evidences that sediments and modified oceanic crust are also being recycled back. And so throughout this huge variable that we have to deal with, which is geological time, uh, this actually has the potential to change uh, the mantle redox state uh, with time. So let's look a little bit uh, on what we're talking about. Uh, so what is this thing uh, called hydrothermal circulation in the oceanic cur uh, crust? What we have depicted here would be a mid-ocean ridge, so pardon, uh, divergent uh, uh, plate tectonic frontier, and so these rocks are hot, they are fractured, and seawater starts migrating down through them uh, into the, so through the volcanic rocks, which are highly permeable, to the le a little bit less permeable uh, vertical sheeted dikes, and eventually, so 
they will reach the, what we call the axial, so the magma chamber which is at the axis of the ridge and they will return back. But meanwhile, these fluids interacted with rocks, themselves were changed, it's not hydrothermal, it's not seawater anymore, it's what we call an hydrothermal fluid, so hydrothermal is essentially a hot fluid. In this case, charged with metals and sulfur that leached from the rocks. So when we measure uh, whether, uh, so when these fluids reach the surface of the ocean again, when it's focalized back, it can discharge in these very exuberant uh, features which are called the black smokers, which was a big scientific discovery, uh, well, somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and if conditions are appropriate, we can actually form an ore deposit, what we call, so a VMS, a volcanogenic massive sulfide deposit. Uh, well, here is a simple case, but like the ones we have in Portugal, in Austral or uh, Neves Korov, that many people from our department, uh, so the geology department, have been studying. But so the, the signatures for these fluids and sulfides is quite narrow uh, in terms of uh, isotopic range, uh, meaning so that something must buffer their composition down below, but it's extremely difficult to assess what goes down below because accessing the ocean crust uh, is, well, essentially through uh, either dredges or drill cores from the International uh, Ocean Drilling Project, which essentially have drilled as deep as well what we have here, and as I will show you, the crust goes further down. So to add to the complexity uh, of the situation, we have growing evidence that we don't have only this shallow hydrothermal circulation, but we also have a deeper hydrothermal circulation and seawater or modified seawater is actually reaching the transition between the, the, the crust and the mantle. So as I told you, we have a, a limited sampling of the oceanic crust because there are huge technological challenges of drilling underneath the 3,500 meters column of water in uh, uh, research vessels. And so the other sampling that we have from the oceanic crust is brought to us by this thing called ophiolite. So I talked about subduction zones and ocean crust being recycled back into the mantle, but sometimes it doesn't go down for reasons we don't totally understand. It is not subducted, it is obducted. So it is emplaced tectonically uh, into uh, land. And so the Samail ophiolite uh, in Oman, so which is essentially here, is the largest and the best preserved ophiolite uh, that we have. Uh, its age is late Cretaceous, so approximately 98 million years, so which is the magmatic ages, and shortly after it was emplaced into the Arabian platform. And um, it has been intensively stu studied throughout the decades and actually now represents what we call as a template for the constitution of uh, the ocean crust. For one particular type of ocean crust, meaning where we have fast spreading and lots of magmatic activity. For example, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is quite different. It's a slow spreading uh, uh, ridge, but uh, the East Pacific rise that would be similar to what represents now the, the Samail Ophiolite would be a fast spreading ridge. Um, so despite the fact that it outcrops extraordinarily well, we're talking about desert, there's no soil, there's no uh, vegetation uh, almost. Um, so the people that are studying this ophiolite for several decades proposed to the ICDP, which is the International Continental Drilling Program, the sort of sister program for IODP, um, to make a series of scientific drilling, uh, uh, drill holes uh, in the ophiolite between 2017 and 18, uh, and this way get a, a fresh sample uh, of sections of the ocean crust, so which have not been properly studied until now. So uh, you have here what I told you is now the template for the ocean crust. So typically we would have, well, perhaps some sediments. Here would be those massive sulfide deposits, the black smokers that I, you saw in the previous figure, uh, the volcanics, the sheeted dike, uh, which essentially are conduits of magma uh, from below, and then everything down to the, the border, so the limit with the mantle, are different types of gabbros, which are the equivalents to a basalt, but that cooled slow, slower uh, inside uh, the crust. So I'm working at the crust mantle, which is which I already have the sulfur isotopes, and it is an extremely complex profile. But uh, I finished uh, analyzing the minerals in our microprobe Friday night. So sorry, I don't have the result yet for that. Uh, and so I will bring you an insight of the GT, the Gabro transect. Okay, 
and I will call this upper crust, and these ones two here, the lower crust. So I will show you results, a little bit of the rocks, uh, then what we can see on regards to the sulfur isotopes, and then also um, the metals. So let's start with GT3, so the, the upper one. Um, and so, <clears throat> I told you these are igneous rocks, but they are hydrothermally altered by fluids. And indeed, when we look at the microscope or into a hand sample, uh, what we see is not the original magmatic minerals, but they are being replaced by a series of uh, hydrothermal minerals, so often hydros minerals, minerals, which are related with these hydrothermal circulation processes. So. Um, we can actually make a, a, an account of how much alteration we have. And so, from my observations, this hole has, on average, 89% of the rocks are replaced. So there's not much of the, it's essentially now a metamorphic rock, not an igneous rock anymore. And indeed, we find no uh, magmatic sulfites. All the sulfites that we see, which are depicted here, there's a little dot over there. Um, so these are all hydrothermal sulfate, uh, sulfites. And what you see here, perhaps not very well with this white color, uh, but so are in situ isotopic measurements which provide me information on, you know, at the grain scale. So I have two types of information for the sulfur isotopes. One is whole rock, gives me the average of the entire rock. And I also made some in situ measurements because this way I can actually see uh, how much change do we have, uh, how much, if they are homogeneous or not, and we can, well, here we cannot see, for example, this little dot over there has a shift from almost 12 to 14 in less than a few millimeters, telling me that the fluids were changing fast as the sulfides were forming. Um, okay, let's go to the lower crust, these two holes, so first GT2 and then GT1, and, well, they represent uh, uh, different types of rocks. You can imagine them as representing small, uh, small magmatic chambers that cool down in originally in the lower crust uh, in a mixture of crystals which are lubricated by, by magma. Um, they also have hydrothermal alteration, but that, as you can see by the average values over there, quite less than what we see uh, in the upper crustal section. It's slightly higher for the lowermost hole, GT1, because it was actually designed to intersect an oceanic fault, so the Zimmermann-Muller fault, it was the name of the colleagues that discovered it in the field, and so this way we have actually a drill hole that we can see what are the effects of seawater being directly channelized into the, um, into the lower crust. So contrarily to the upper crust rocks, so oh, this is here, Sorry. Okay. We still see magmatic sulfides. There's a lot of magmatic sulfides and they present their typical magmatic signature. But then we see as rocks become, so for rocks which are more altered, we see them being gradually leached out until they almost disappear. And we also see a few hydrothermal sulfides precipitating and their signature is a little heavier okay, than the zero that would be expectable from mantle values. So. Let's look at uh, now the whole rock values for the, the sulfur isotopes. And so here on the left side, we have that uh, observation. So these are very independent observations. On X, we have the alteration percent. So what I see when I look in the microscope and I see 50%, 60% of the minerals are completely altered. And these are the values for the isotopes. And we can see that generally, and especially for the upper crust rocks, there is definitely a correlation between how heavy the isotopic signature is uh, and how altered the rock. So if you remember that I told you mantle values, which is the same as meteorites, is zero, okay? What's making this shift? Seawater has a lot of sulfate, okay? And sulfate has a heavy signature. Nowadays, seawater, if we go and measure it, it would have 21 per mil. Uh, the, the sulfur signature, but it has changed throughout geological time. And in the Cretaceous, so when all of this happened and these rocks were formed and these processes, hydrothermal processes happened, it was 17, okay? So pure seawater from the Cretaceous would be 17, which is, well, more or less here. You will see it in the next diagram. And what we can see is that, especially for the upper crust rocks, they are extremely shifted. So all of this process of alteration, indeed, 
shows us that they incorporated large amounts of sulfur scavenged from the seawater, so from the, these hydrothermal fluids. Here on the right, we have again the same, uh, so the isotopic values, and here the total concentrations of sulfur that we have in the rock. Okay? And so this actually allows to understand which are the processes that are responsible for the fixation or the loss. I don't like this mic, sorry. <laughs> or the loss of sulfur uh, in the rocks. So, of course, as we go to zero, we will have leaching, okay? So that sulfur is being uh, or oxidized out of the rock. And so, what we see is for the lower crustal rocks, they are all very nested here, so close to zero, to the mantle values. Probably some have more sulfur because they have lots of magmatic sulfites, and the ones which are slightly heavier, which we saw the in situ values, is because, so they show a little bit of incorporation of seawater on those uh, hydrothermal sulfites. Now, when we look at the upper crust, it's a completely different picture. We have, so all the input of sulfur in these rocks has a very heavy signature, so almost up to 13, if my memory doesn't fail, um, due to interaction with seawater. There is, however, one little dot over here, um, so which has about minus 12. So, and as I told you, bacterial mediated processes are able to fractionate isotopic signatures towards very negative values. And so, obviously, bacteria cannot survive at the temperatures at which uh, some of these hydrothermal alteration processes. When we look at the mineralogy, we know that this happened somewhere between 250 and 400 degrees. So we know that sulfate reduction bacteria, they can survive up to 110. So this means that probably this was a very late feature that happened uh, during what we call the off axis. So when actually the crust moves away from the, the hot spreading center and cool water can enter again and so we, we could have conditions to form this, um, these bacteria. So let's put this into perspective, okay, into how, how they were originally, so vertically within the crust. And um, so we see for the upper crust strong bleaching. So here again we have sulfur contents and on, and on the left we have the isotopes. So strong bleaching, these rocks have almost no sulfur at all, okay? And then a peak for seawater incorporation of sulfur, more or less in the middle of the hole, and then they gradually descend uh, to the bottom. And so, if you remember the values that I show you in the, those first slides, and I told you VMSs, black smokers, so everything that is discharged on the seawater has a, a signature around zero to six, more or less, uh, at the bottom of, uh, so just here, uh, or at the bottom of this hole, we are more or less within that range. So the fluids that we have here are already the fluids that will be discharged into the ocean floor. So they have exactly the same composition. However, in some places we find sulfides being precipitated in large amounts, which is not common. So sulfide to, to precipitate, you need to cool down the fluid. And so we thought about, and I, I discussed this with our, uh, um, with our master student, and then I remember when I was logging this course, and we saw lots of fault zones, of so highly fractured rocks, so deep faults, and probably what happens is that we have cold fluids coming into these faults, okay, and enabled for us to have this sulfide precipitation over here. So when we do some mass balance, saying, okay, these rocks should be have zero when they form, which is the sulfur isotopic signature of the mantle, and now they have up to 14, okay, how much seawater do I have to to input in these rocks, so what is the fluxes of sulfur that I need to input to reach these compositions. And we reach to, well, trust me, it's a staggering number of 37%. You will see this compared to modern day an an analogs and it's, it's very far uh, from that. When we look at the lower crust, so we see, so this line here is the zero for the mantle and here is the seawater composition. Well, we see that most values are still very similar to mantle values. So there is small shifts, and when we do the mass balance, indeed, we have that, well, on average, 7% of seawater reach the lower crust to, to form um, these shifted compositions. However, besides of sulfides, 
We also were able to, during the sequential extraction process in the, lab, in the laboratory, we, we extract different types of sulfate, sulfides and then sulfates, also the soluble sulfates. And quite surprisingly, okay, we found sulfates very deep uh, in, the, so in the lower crust. And um, as I told you, especially for, for GT1 here, okay, there's a series of faults some that were intersected uh, and these faults, we know that they had hydrothermal activity. We see, we see discharge, evidence for discharge on the surface. And so this means that seawater was entering and being channelized in, through these faults and precipitating sulfates with basically 17, which is the, the, the signature for, for seawater um, in the crust. Now let's look at the metals to finish. And so what you have here plotted, these are the shipboard values. So for nickel, zinc, and copper, so the lower crust rocks are here in pink, and the greens and blues are the upper, upper crust, which is hydrothermal, very altered, and with the large shifts. So when we, uh, also in all of them, there is a vertical line, and this is only a qualitative observation of what would be the average composition of these metals in a mid-ocean ridge basalt, so the more which is written over there. Um, and so we see that nickel, well, they more or less nest around it. We have here higher values, but this is normal. It's the, what we expect from deep rocks, which are very primitive. And so they will be with more magnesium and more nickel. Uh, zinc, we expect it to be gradually on higher concentrations as these rocks become more evolved, so towards the top. However, so this is okay, this is also okay, but this should be there on that line. So, and apparently there is a zinc depletion on these rocks. And I think you all see uh, that copper has a neck problem uh, over there on the top. And so there is apparently a lot of copper missing in the upper crustal section. So as I told you, these are qualitative observations for us to actually quantify how much metal is being leached. So what are the, the fluxes which are here in cause we have to see, okay, for each rock, I should have this amount of copper. I actually have this amount and then transform this into um, a, a value. So here are the sulfur isotopes from before. This is just for the upper crust. And these are, so zero means the rock neither lost or gained copper or zinc, okay, relative to the magmatic original rock. Um, plus, it, if the values are to the right plus, that means it gained metals. If it's for the negative values, then it means it lost metals. And I think you all can see okay, that zinc is at least 50% gone okay, in these upper crust, crustal rocks. And copper is almost completely leached out of these rocks. And so the first diagram that I showed you with the other thermal circulation where we had the black smokers in the end, these are the roots of a VMS system. Okay. The isotopic composition we have here is already the composition of a, a typical fluid. And what we are seeing is the fluids leaching out the metals to then form those black smokers and those volcanic massive sulfides on top. Now the question is, is this a little or a lot? Or what, I mean, how does this fit? So I have here exactly the same type of diagram with delta plus and less values for copper and zinc for pitodip which is in the East Pacific rise, which I told you is the modern analog for the Samael ophiolite. And you can see that, so they, they made a large bar over here. So, oh, I have the screen here. And I cannot see. Well, zinc I think goes to about 50, okay? And copper is 100, 100. But so you can see that they do have leaching of metals, but nothing as, as exuberant as we are actually looking in the ophiolite, okay? And so as it's, in this final uh, take-home message uh, that, that I leave you with, it has been long discussed that the crust of ophiolites is, uh, uh, has higher hydrothermal fluxes than what we see today in modern oceanic crust. So this has nothing to do with post-oceanic deformation. Okay? We're talking about samples of ophiolites which are well-preserved. And there's a lot of discussion about this, and so these data come to, 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 to support, again, um, this idea. So you can see, for example, here, again, for one of the IODP holes, the sulfur values are up to three in the dikes. I have up to 14. So you can see how shifted 
they are. So how much hydrothermal alteration? So one of the possible uh, conclusions that this can uh, um, let us know, so whatever the reason is behind these higher hydrothermal fluxes, well, if I can leach out more sulfur, more copper, more zinc, probably also can make more easily a volcanic massive deposit. So for now, this is where I stand. I thank you for your attention. So this has been my journey, and on Sunday I go to France to do some more analysis on my rocks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for letting us know about the, the life of sulfur within the ocean crust and its importance. Now we move on to uh, trying to understand a bit more on how uh, environmental conditions and spider mites coexist. And I ask uh, Ines Fregata, a woman in science, uh, L'Oreal Award E, to tell us about it. Ines, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, can everybody hear me? Okay, so first of all, thank you for having the opportunity today to talk about this work. And um, it's, I'm a little rusty because it's been a long time since I actually talked in public, so forgive me if I miss out something in the meanwhile. So, first of all, I want to tell you that uh, this work could not have been done without these wonderful people around here. So, and that, wait, 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 where is it? It's not. Now it is. So, and that uh, we have uh, this posted on BioArchive in case you actually want to take a look at it. Okay, and this all started because in nature we see that a lot of species occupy the same type of niche. And when I say niche here, I'm talking about the resources, the space that they use, even, for example, plants that like to uh, fight for the light that they can have to, in order to do the photosynthesis. So we know that a lot of species compete and they occupy the same niche. And how can these species coexist in the same environment then? And this has, is a puzzle in, uh, that has been uh, puzzled ecologists for a long time. And um, uh, Peter Chesson provided uh, some clues for this with the modern coexistence theory. And he uh, said that we could predict how species could coexist uh, if we looked at two different parameters of, this, of the species. First of all, it's the niche overlap. And in this case, when I talk about the niche overlap, I'm thinking of whether they consume the same resources at the same time, if they occupy the same space. And here we have some uh, expectations. So if there is, no, yeah, I can't, aha. So if, uh, if there is large niche overlap between the two species, then we expect that the competition between them will be much larger and the effect of competition will be detrimental more between themselves than within each species, right? Which is the intraspecific competition, so within species versus the interspecific inter competition. However, if we have a small niche overlap, then what we expect is that the competition that the, the, the individuals of the same species have for, for the same resource will be larger than the one between the two species, okay? This is one of the things that will affect whether species can coexist or not. The second thing will be the fitness differences. And here, fitness differences is just how well uh, uh, um, a species can consume the resource and use it to survive and reproduce and pass the, 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 their genetic uh, material to the next generation, okay? And here what we, have, we expect then, if we have large fitness differences, then we expect that one of the species will be a better competitor than the other. On the other hand, if we have a small, small fitness differences, then species should be more or less equivalent. And now, if we plot this uh, here in, in, this, in this type of plot, where we have fitness difference on the y-axis, and here the niche differences, which is just one minus niche overlap, okay, so basically this is how, how much species overlap in the resources that they consume, and how different are there in their ability to consume those resources and reproduce and survive, okay? And then we can predict if, the, if fitness differences between the two species are smaller than the niche, over, uh, niche differences between them, then the species can coexist. Otherwise, they will be excluding one another. And this type of, of theory has actually been pretty useful for us to determine whether species can coexist or not. But Chesson did not take into account something in, in, his, in his theory. One of them is, is that, that there are extrinsic factors for our species that can affect how they can exist. 
One of them is deterministic factors. For example, if one species is more adapted to one environment or the other. And the other one is the stochastic factors. For example, whether species arrive first or later at, uh, when they colonize a new environment. And in, the, in my grant, I will be working with both these factors, but today I will be talking to you about the stochastic factors. And here, I will focus on order of arrival. And what do I mean with order of arrival? It's basically so if we have here one scenario where we have species arriving at the same time, then we have an outcome. And in this case, I, plot the, I put the outcome as the two species coexisting more or less equivalently. However, when I put first the green arriving and only later the, the red, then the outcome can change drastically. And here we have green dominating and the red uh, being excluded. And the other way around can be uh, happening when the red species arrives first. And this basically means that the order or timing of arrival during the community assembly can actually change the outcome between the interspecific interactions between the species. And this can give rise to priority effects, which is basically when the either species being able to survive or not in an environment is dominated by a positive frequency dependence in which the species that arrives first can eat a lot of the, of the resources available, can spread out, and this prevents the new species of actually being able to colonize the new environment. Okay? And so, basically, when we plot this and our, remember, <laughs> I struggle with this pointer, I'm sorry. Mm, here. Okay, so remember this site was the previous plot that we saw there, and now we expanded it to the other side. And this work was done by Ken Latin in 2018, and basically they, they located the, a region of that plot where there is priority effects, which means that the species that arrives first dominates, and it's it, the exact opposed, opposite of the coexistence area that we saw before. And however, this type of, of theoretical predictions have not been tested. So we thought it would be a good idea to test them in herbivores. And why herbivores? Because uh, order of arrival should be important in herbivore communities since the early arriving uh, herbivore can actually occupy the space or reduce the nutrient availability by eating the plants. It can elicit plant defense reduction, which is a method for plants to actually defend themselves against herbivores, or can even suppress plant defense reduction and facilitate the, the life of the second arriving herbivore. And basically, so this could actually give rise to priority effects in our system. So what we are focusing here is how this order of arrival determines herbivore coexistence and what is the role of priority effects on herbivore coexistence. And for that, we used uh, spider mites. These uh, little guys are uh, a, a, an agri agricultural pest and um, they are very known for, uh, <laughs> for eating a lot of crops. Tetanic zurtica in particular can eat around uh, more than 100 t types of, of different crops and it's usually a defense inductor, which means that when it, it arrives, the plant tr tries to defend against him. On the other hand, we have Tetranicus evanzi, which is a tomato specialist that invaded from South America, and he's a defense suppressor, which means that when he arrives, he slows down the response of the plant to, to, to the herbivore attack. And the fact, I although we know that Tetranicus evanzi outcompetes urtica in, on tomato plants, when we go out to the field, we actually see them a lot of times coexisting in the same plant. And so we were wondering how could this happen and whether priority effects or the order of arrival could actually play a role on this. And so we decided to test this. Uh, so basically what we did was we put uh, either uh, uh, females from, Urti from Evanzi or Urtike in a box or the two together. And then we basically varied either the order of arrival by letting them arrive at the same time, Evanzi first or Urtike first. And then we also varied the initial frequency by either having only one species, 119, 1010, or uh, the other way around. And we counted the number of individuals in all leaves after two generations. And for all of these treatments, we estimated the growth rate and the inter in interspecific competition, which we will then be used so that we can estimate the fitness differences and the niche overlap and try to plot our nice uh, prediction of whether species can coexist. But first, so just looking at the raw numbers, we have here the initial frequency, first Urtica and then Evanzi. So here we have one Urtica, 19 Evanzi um, on, all, on all the different treatments that I had. 
Okay, and then here's the proportion of Tia Z. So if it's above this line, Evanzi is winning. If it's below this line, Urtike is winning. And what we can see here in general is that Evanzi is a better competitor than Urtike on tomato, which is something that uh, we were expecting, so it's good that it actually arose here. Um, and we actually see that when uh, Urtike arrives first or starts at high density, Evanzi is not able to exclude them, which means that there is some advantage on, uh, on these two uh, um, occasions. And so if we go and plot our, uh, um, our coexistence plot, where we have here again the niche differences and the fitness differences, and we have here uh, the three different treatments, we can see first of all is that in general, Evanzi is, excludes Urtike in uh, most of the cases. Um, however, in, uh, when if, uh, Urtike arrives first, there's actually coexistence between the two species, which is rather weird because we actually would expect that some, some of them would fall in this area over here. But uh, things not always uh, happen when we, how we expect. And so we went to find out how was this happening. And so what we did was we looked at what leaves did they prefer? Because before that I should have told you that we tested four different tomato leaves. And these four different tomato leaves have different uh, uh, nutrient uh, availability and also the plant defends them in different ways. So we act, when we look at the leaf position, the leaves two, three, and four, and five, and we look at the proportion of Teavanzi when it's by itself, we see that it actually has a clear preference for leaves three and four. And, um, and so we went to see what happens when we actually add the other species. And what we can see is that here we have again our leaf positions, and here what we were looking as at was how much different is the distribution of Evanzi when it's in, in, in the presence of the competitor in comparison with the distribution that it has usually by himself? And you can see is basically again that whenever the, they are above this line, there's more Evanzi. Here it's below the line, we have more Urtike. And what we can see is that when uh, uh, Urtike arrives first, um, uh, yeah, sorry, when Urtike arrives first, it actually that Evans is displaced by, from his preferred uh, food resource. And when uh, Urtike uh, um, is starts with a higher density or at the same density, it actually um, displaces Evansi mostly from leaf three. And so what we think that is happening is that Evansi is not able to reach his preferred food. And so it's not able to overcompete Urtike and we get this type of, uh, we get the, pro the coexistence that we saw in the previous um, uh, plot. And so, just to finish, we saw that the order of arrival can change the coexistence probability of the two species, but it's actually not through priority effects as we expected initially. It, and the most interesting thing is that uh, here I'm talking about a 48 hour difference between the, the arriving of the two species. So this means that the small differences in order of arrival can actually be sufficient for one of the species to monopolize resources. And this is super cool because this means that small differences in time percolate into uh, the small differences in space, which can foster different um, uh, resource use for the different species and can foster coexistence and maintenance of diversity. And uh, so I just want to thank uh, the Might Squad for putting up to me and helping out on doing all of this. And of course, for the funding uh, um, agencies and you for your attention. Thank you, Inesh. And now we move to the, the final presentation of this uh, session and uh, to a um, different approach to um, society um, recognition. Uh, and back to breast cancer, in fact. Um, Andrea Valente, belonging to the um, Center of Chemo uh, Experimental Chemistry, will tell us about a new way of treating uh, breast cancer. And uh, this is being uh, quite interesting because it's an idea that has been leading into a spin-off, right? Yeah. So please tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and for the opportunity to present to you all our new cell a new spin-off from the Faculty of Sciences um, from the University of Lisbon. So, I am uh, Andrea and myself and uh, Professor Elena Garcia are the founders of this spin-off. 
we are both uh, researchers here at the faculty and at Centro de Química Estrutural. Uh, professor Helena was uh, an associated professor here for many years, she is now jubilated, and uh, our advisory board is constituted by Professor uh, Jorge Maialves, uh, subdirector here at FCU, and by Rita Tomé, FCU's Technology Transfer uh, Office Coordinator. And our management uh, team is uh, constituted by MBA uh, Francisco Rodrigues. Uh, our shareholders are Faculdade, are, uh, Faculdade de Ciências, Portugal Ventures, and two private investors, uh, Miguel Ribeiro Ferreira and Isabel de Bouton. And our mission, as uh, it was already said, is to develop innov innovative chemotherapeutics to treat metastatic cancers. How this idea came about? So it all started here at the Faculdade, uh, at C8 building uh, at our organometallic chemistry laboratory and at Professor Elena Garcia Research Group. Uh, she uh, is an uh, inorganic and organometallic chemist and she developed uh, organometallic compounds mainly based on iron and ruthenium for many years applied to, to different um, applications. Then in more or less 2006, she uh, started a new research line here at FCU where she developed compounds to treat uh, cancer. And uh, myself, I joined the team uh, later in 2013 with uh, my IF position to develop polymer ruthenium complexes for targeted drug delivery. And so this was uh, the first steps into this uh, research. And you might ask why ruthenium? So ruthenium is a very versatile metal, and it is also versatile under uh, physiological conditions. Actually, it is very stable under several oxidation states. It has the potential to mimic uh, uh, the bioessential metal iron uh, into the binding of two biomolecules, such albumin or transferrin. These are transport proteins, meaning that uh, these compounds might be transported in the blood by them until the tumor. And also, I don't know if you are aware, but many of the current chemotherapeutics are based uh, on uh, platinum drugs, more or less 50% of each treatment uses a platinum drug, but of course you all know they are very toxic. Here it's uh, represented uh, the drug cisplatinum that was the first metallo drug to be used in cancer treatment. And of course, uh, they present severe side effects. So also the data so far has shown that uh, in general, ruthenium compounds present lower toxicity than platinum-based drugs. Also when we started this research, there were already two promising compounds in clinical trials. So uh, the first one here passed through phase one and two of clinical trials, and the second until phase one. Uh, however, they were abandoned due to solubility issues and also um, stability issues. However, not all are good, bad news because uh, this compound here on the right, they replaced this uh, ion here by sodium and actually uh, it increased a lot its solubility and is now running uh, some clinical trials in combination with other drugs and so these are very exciting results. So, uh, also it's worth men mentioning that this compound, namely A, it's also able to treat metastases. These are the secondary cancers that are indeed the main cause of uh, death by cancer. So, our strategy in this area has been to use this organometallic uh, moiety that uh, uh, we are, uh, we have a lot of um, chemical knowledge on this subject and we found out that this moiety is very stable, even in very harsh conditions, being a very good scaffold to develop uh, uh, another com other types of compounds. So we started by developing the first uh, family of compounds, the first generation. We synthesized all over the years more than 70 compounds. They are subjected to several biochemical, chemical and biological assays. We have done structure activity studies, and from this family we selected some as leads that we further developed as a second generation of compounds to which we have added some vectors to targeting cancer uh, to increase solubility and so on. So in general, we intend to develop compounds that answer these three problems of uh, uh, chemo current chemo 
I <laughs> chemotherapeutics. So one of the problems is related to metastasis. Uh, so uh, even if we are able to treat the primary tumor, if the cancer has already spread to other parts of the body, its treatment is very difficult, and the current treatments does, do not respond to this. Also, a second problem uh, is the lack of selectivity. This means that the current treatments target not only the cancer cells, but also the uh, normal cells, leading to severe side effects. And finally, uh, the multidrug resistance that is indeed responsible for the more than 19% of cancer treatment fail, failure of metastatic uh, cancers. Uh, so, so far, this is our uh, uh, company's uh, roadmap. We have started all over the years uh, to raise funds for this research. In the field of anti-cancer drugs, we raised uh, more or less 600,000 uh, euros. And with this, we developed these families of compounds that I just described. Then uh, we had the second generation that we thought was worth uh, patenting, and we did it. We did, submitted the uh, national patent in 2014, then in 2015 the international patent, and now in 2000, uh, 2021 the patent is already granted in most of the countries with pharmaceutical interest. We are only pending in two countries. Then uh, this, the submission of the patent was very important for the next steps of our company. So next, we won this contest, Science into Business, organized by the Tech Labs here at Fukul, and this gave us the opportunity to contact with private investors. And actually, uh, two of them here, Miguel Ferreira and Isabel de Bouton, uh, actually uh, invested in our project in 2017. And then later this year, uh, 2021, we um, when the Portugal Ventures and of ID contest. And so uh, after this, uh, we decided to, uh, to create our spin-off uh, that was first called Something in Ends, and then we rebranded it as our new cell. And uh, already as a spin-off company, we were uh, at the semi-finals of the InnoStar Awards 2021. This is a very competitive call from the European Union. And uh, we actually win some uh, uh, a prize for mentoring and also to carry on our in vivo studies that we are running so far. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, we want to answer, uh, uh, to give an answer to metastatic cancers, but nowadays we are mainly focused on the breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer. So we want to create a future for women with this disease. And why metastatic breast cancer? This is actually the second most lethal disease in women. There are 1.55 million cases per year, and this disease has no cure. You probably heard already about many women that survived the breast cancer, but this is usually a hormonal dependent breast cancer, meaning that the, treat the treatment is based on hormones, and these uh, cancers respond to that. This is not the case of metastatic breast cancer. This uh, cancer does not respond to any therapy, and actually what they use in the clinics it to, is to give a cocktail of drugs that will just extend the life of the woman, but not treat them. And so we are very um, compromised uh, uh, in investing in this area. So our innovative uh, drug is already at TRL4, and here, just for the purpose of this presentation, this is just uh, an image for you to understand what uh, our drug is about. So we call our drug here for this purpose as a drug soldier, where we have here our cytotoxic core, it's a ruthenium drug, and we add here some vectors for the cancer uh, targeting. So these uh, drugs in solution, they self-assemble as nanoparticles, forming these Trojan horses. And then when are, they are close to the tumor, they will release the encapsulated drug and treat uh, the cancer. So, so far, uh, we already proven that our drug is, uh, our preliminary data indicate that is efficient against metastasis, is able to overcome the multidrug resistance, uh, is able to decrease the primary tumor, and also does not present any uh, relevant side effect. 
Our ongoing studies are to prove uh, the efficiency against metastasis in meat mice. Our previous studies were done in another animal model, and that's our uh, working uh, right, our work right now. Since we are uh, a spin-off, you also need to be uh, aware about the market. And uh, you can see here that the metastatic breast cancer therapeutics market is very uh, high, over three, 32 billion euros in 2018, and is increasing. And uh, here in this table, you can see the, the numbers of the oncology division revenue of the top pharmaceutical companies in the world. And so uh, these are numbers um, that we might achieve if we uh, find a drug capable of treating these cancers, and th these are also, of course, our competitors. So now, uh, in order to be able to finish this work, we need to raise some funds, and now we are talking about uh, uh, real funds, so over one million euros. For that, with the funding we have now uh, granted, we will pursue our in vivo studies that are running so far, then in 22-23, we need to run some more preclinical assays like pharmacokinetics, metabolism, safety studies, and so on. And as soon as these studies are completed, if the results are positive, we are in the position to sell our patent, to license our patent to a pharmaceutical company by 2024-2025. Uh, just to conclude, to sensitize you a bit more to this problem, during this speech, uh, 40 women were diagnosed with breast cancer and four of them have died. And so we uh, will accept any help we can get to try to solve this problem. And so thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. Well, it's time to uh, move to lunch. Uh, we're running a bit out of, uh, the behind schedule, sorry. So we'll keep it um, 2.30 p.m. as reconvenience time. So we'll be back at 2 p.m. after lunch. I also remind you that we have plenty of things that can be done, including lunch, during the lunch hour, like looking at the posters, uh, having a speed date with the researchers that are around, visit the lab, and all of this is um, duly scheduled at our website so you can uh, look at it and find out where to go, where you want to, where you want to go. Okay, so uh, thank you all for this morning and we'll be back at 2.30 p.m. sharp. Thank you very much.
science, as important as the answers are the new and never-ending questions. It is these questions and the researchers who ask them that allow us to advance our knowledge in all fields. Questions that help us understand and tackle global challenges such as climate change. Questions that lead to the discovery of new worlds and to the development of new technologies. Ciências de Lisboa is an epicenter of science of excellence. Let's learn about it together. Welcome. Ciencias Research Day 2021. Just a minute. So we are back. Welcome again to our Research Day 2021. We will continue the day uh, with the Professor um, Margarida Santos Reis. And the next session is Science for Society, Understanding Climate Change. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. And we welcome you all again to those that were in the morning and those that just joined us. So as you probably know, we are in the third edition of the Science Research Day. And since the second edition, we decided that it was a good idea to have some thematic sessions that can show how science has the ability to address the same problem or the same challenge in different views. And this is the case. So last year, we devoted this session to COVID. It was unavoidable. This year, we decided that climate change is a, a challenge that is in the order of the day and that affects all of us. So we will start now the session. So we invite uh, um, some of the researchers that are addressing this, uh, tackling this problem. Of course, we have many others that can do also presentations, but time is not enough, and we have to make a selection. So the best way to start this presentation, this session, is with the presentation of Ricardo Trigo. He is the coordinator of Instituto Don Luis. Is a reference in in climate sciences, in climate change in particular and is going to uh, explain us to what extent our recent climate extremes associated to climate change. And I'm sure we will be amazed with this. <laughs> with it. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Just a correction, I'm not the, the director of Sorry. IDL anymore. In any case, I thought that this topic would be interesting in this context because not only we've been working for two decades on extreme events at IDL, but also because in the last year we've heard a lot about extreme, extreme events, such as the precipitation and floods in Germany or the 50 degrees in, uh, in uh, Canada for the first time, five degrees above the previous maximum. So uh, the easiest way of starting this is with an easy variable, and that is temperature. Temperature is much easier to handle and you can see here the result from a 10-year-old famous paper by the head of uh, NASA Climate Division, James Hansen. And uh, it was the first time that we could see when you look into uh, all northern hemisphere, thousands of stations during summer, that uh, if you divide these in color by decade, you can notice that uh, the first three decades up to the 70s, there's no change and the frequency of extremes doesn't really change that much. But beginning in the 80s and uh, until 10 years ago, you see this uh, sequential move towards the right and what used to be an extreme event between two and three degrees became a much more regular one. And so you can imagine that 10 years after, the next figure that will be added, the next uh, Gaussian curve will be something like that and some of the extremes that I've been mentioning in the next uh, half an hour in fact correspond to what you can see here. Let me tell you also that these, uh, 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 these curves in fact fit very well what was suggested in an IPCC report 15 years ago that would be the most likely, likely change in terms of uh, maximum temperature. So uh, an a increase of the in the mean, but also any, an increase in the variance. Right, so uh, 
the first time we realized that something out of ordinary was happening was with the heat wave in 2003. And why? Because at the time we uh, realized after that summer that uh, 50,000 people uh, excessive death occurred during that summer. What happened during the first uh, two weeks of uh, August, you can see this intrusion of uh, uh, Saharan air into Western Europe, in fact, uh, reaching first Portugal and then to Northern France and Germany. And uh, just uh, one of the results in terms of uh, excessive death, about 15 uh, excessive uh, deaths in France. And here I show you by department, and you can see in this brown color, uh, uh, departments in France where it reached more than 100% of the expected uh, uh, number of people that should usually would die during that period. Also, in uh, this is difficult to control. Also, in terms of fires, which is something that uh, occurs quite frequently in Portugal, you can see that uh, the total burn area per uh, year was very high. Let me stress that these numbers are incredibly high. This is higher than what you see annual in France or Italy or Greece, and in fact, it's comparable with Spain. So, suddenly in 2003, we have more than the double of the previous maximum. So this is outstanding in that year, more than half of the total burn area in Europe was in Portugal. And two years afterward, during a major drought that I will mention, it occurred again. So something really out of the ordinary was happening. And you can see here, based on satellite data, where it uh, took place, uh, particularly during the first two weeks of August, here shown in red, where all these areas, for example, usually never burn. In uh, Porto Alegre and Santarém district, it's more often here and sometimes also here. Uh, but not only the amount, but also the location was quite unusual. Just a few years after, in 2010, something similar but even larger and stronger took place in Eastern uh, Europe and Russia. And so here I'm showing a 2000 heat wave in a, a number of uh, different timescales from week to month to the entire season. The colors show the anomaly that can go up to 13, 14 degrees. The ISO line shows the anomalies in standard deviation. And uh, to put in perspective, 2003 was a three something standard deviation in all these time scales, while the Russian heat wave was a four standard deviation. So really much, much stronger, very uh, vast in terms of spatial extent. And these dots here show by how much, by how many degrees this uh, maximum value was above the previous maximum in 100 years. So you see that in all time scales, records were broken. If we consider the entire European window here, and we use all the observed data in Europe that extends 300 years, and we can extend even further with proxy data from trees and uh, uh, ice cores, we can put these very simple graphics showing European summer temperature for the last 500 years, from this until 2002, and you can see that the theoretical Gaussian fit fits pretty well uh, the gray line until the beginning of the 21st century. We start to see a number of uh, summers here, including 2003 and 2010, that are uh, totally outside the typical summer behavior. And this is when we start calling uh, mega heat waves, 2003, 2010, and a few after that. We uh, published this in, uh, 10 years ago in science, and uh, we moved on, but let me tell you a parallel story concerning droughts. Until a few years ago, we would study these, we and all groups in Europe, uh, separately, but now we realize that we must study together. And so droughts, you have something of a singular uh, tendency. Uh, for example, in 2004, 2005, we can see the largest drought in uh, uh, Iberia, and that means that uh, uh, for places like uh, Lisbon and Madrid, with more than 150 years of data, this was really the strongest drought ever observed. And just a few years after, something very similar took place again, okay? Just six, seven years after. And when we put these in context, 
for 100 years of data, we realize that the three strongest droughts in all Liberia, concerning all Liberia, took place in the last decade and a half, okay? And in fact, 2016 and 17 could be added there, and this is in fact are the four mo most intense ones. And so we've looked at these using dynamical models, and a huge number of dynamical models run in Oxford by these people that uh, use uh, spare time from the computers. And so the results I'm going to show here, obtained with our colleagues in Oxford, were obtained in more than 2,000 uh, GCMs running uh, simultaneously. And uh, it's a very simple metric. It's showing the total precipitation typical of a very dry year and the amount of time it used to take back in the 60s uh, with the return period of more than 40 years that is decreasing over time due to climate change. When these models, you consider the uh, greenhouse gases there uh, that have been injected into the atmosphere, you see that this return period for such a dry year is reducing to something like 30 years and is reducing more and more, okay? So these are results from dynamical models that are compatible with this decrease in terms of uh, return period for very dry years. Now, just a few years ago, I, I'm sure that most of you remember, we had again an outstanding fire season and outstanding in many different ways. Uh, first, it was, it never burned so much, more than 500 uh, hectares, uh, 500,000 hectares. Then some of the largest fires took place prior to the official fire season and after the official fire season. And these in October, in fact, it was just one day or one day and a half, very, very fast. And of course, unfortunately, we had uh, about 135 fatalities associated with these. So the question is, what are the main mechanisms associated with uh, these uh, fires? And in this regard, it's becoming more common to see what we call compounded events. That means there's not only one reason for this, but uh, several reasons. Typically drought, heat waves, and in the case of uh, uh, October 2016, uh, uh, 17, we'll see something else. But we must separate between what happened in June, and in June we know that uh, there, were, uh, there was a blocking pattern here staying for a while in June, and looking at uh, the weekly scale for all the data we have, you can see here the average of all Junes for Iberia, and what happened during this week is above everything else observed in the previous 70 years of all Junes for Iberia. In fact, the heat wave is very similar to the strongest heat waves in July and August. This is again the trademark of uh, climate change. Events that used to occur only at the peak of the summer season in July and August now are starting to occur in June and uh, late September, even uh, October, okay? So this was the strongest ever uh, heat wave at the week scale in June. In October, uh, we can see three different things. Not only it was very warm due to a combination of factors, one of which was the uh, percentage of the territory under the most extreme uh, uh, drought cases. You can see here uh, the year going by and uh, the two most intense droughts I mentioned, the 2004 and the 2011, that reached sooner or later 100% of the territory under extreme conditions. That was apparently not the case with 2016 and 17. But in fact, here in June, during the first fires, it raised tremendously. And then in October, all the country was under extreme drought. Besides, we had something really out of the ordinary and that was a tropical cyclone passing through. Now the thing is, are these three mechanisms changing with climate change? I mean, heat waves, droughts, and tropical cyclones. And apparently heat waves, w w we know for sure they are changing, I will show you. Droughts a little bit, but uh, tropical cyclones, we don't have sufficient numbers here 
to provide an answer with the statistical significance. But the amount of data we have uh, appears to indicate that something is happening in that direction. Now, still concerning what happened in this uh, outstanding year, we published two years ago in scientific reports, a very simple model, this is a statistical model, that uh, it's not difficult to reproduce the amount of burn area in Portugal just using um, typical uh, climate and mythological variables concerning how much it rained in winter and in spring previous to the summer and how many days of heat waves we had during summer. With three, four variables, you can reproduce 70 to 80 percent of the variance of the total burn area. Now, what happens, and it's difficult to see here because the light ray is not very easy to see, but uh, the observed area, uh, burn area, is represented here. This gray color is corresponds to the models without tendency in terms of uh, higher temperature and lower levels of humidity. And uh, there's a light gray color here that corresponds to the uh, curve in terms of uh, models that uh, incorporate the drought and temperatures that we are observing. This means that in the last two decades and in the future, just based on climate, we should have more years like 2003, 5, and 2017. It's not burning more, not because of climate, but in spite of climate. And that is due to lack of fuels, because some years it burns so much that there's lack of fuels. And in some years where uh, climate conditions are not too, too uh, are sufficiently uh, easy to be handled by firefighters and civil protection, these lower year, then it's easier to protect. But from a climate perspective, we will see again this type of situation in the coming decade. Okay? Now, just one year after, in 2018, we had the strongest weak uh, heat wave ever in Portugal. You can see not only the absolute temperatures here, but you can see all the stations here depicted in color. The local record was uh, surpassed. And in Lisbon, the 150 year of, uh, time series was surpassed by two degrees. And that is not typical of this situation. Typically, it's just half a degree, three uh, th decimal points or whatever, not two, three degrees like it's uh, happening in so many places. Only Beja, for example, or Porto, uh, and a few others, you don't see that. Now, what happened in this year? It burned so much in the previous year that uh, it prevent from more fires during 2018. And not only that, but also the, the, this is, it was just during five, seven days, not three weeks. And that's a, a major difference. The only place where it burned quite a lot was here in Monchi. Now, if we return again to this type of graphic, we can see that the, the symmetrical shape of this distribution is moving and is becoming uh, much more asymmetric. And 2018, that I mentioned, and all these years are adding to this uh, skewness of the distribution. In fact, 2018 was a record in all this area in Portugal, but also in Holland, Belgium, and uh, Scandinavia, and many other places in Europe. That in itself, uh, it's important, but what is remarkable is that one year after, we had an even stronger, not one, but two heat waves, okay? one at the end of June and the other at the end of July, all the area with gray, uh, gray uh, dots correspond to new records, uh, either in June or Ju June was here and South France and July, uh, Northern France and all these uh, areas. So uh, this repetition of uh, new heat wave values, for example, the French record that was 44 in 2003 jump to 46 here in the southern of uh, uh, France. And so we return to this type of representation where you can see that it doesn't make sense anymore like it used to do 20 years ago to represent the 500 years with a Gaussian curve. If we pick the last 30, 40 years, 
it has become a completely detached curve following what was predicted to happen. And uh, the problem is not only that this is uh, totally detached from that one, but it's a non-stationary problem. So we know that this is moving and we have no idea where it's going to end, okay? But for sure it's moving uh, uh, to the right and uh, for a few years more. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, linking this to anthropogenic uh, contribution, I choose this paper in Nature Climate Change by our colleagues in uh, ETH in Swiss which provide a, a simple approach. You just need to think on the probability of exceeding a certain percentile. Let's think about 99 or 99.9 .9, and think about uh, this metric, probability ratio. So if, if the probability increases by three times, then this number is three. And then they show that the fraction of attributable risk to human action is given by this very simple uh, expression. Now, this, the thing is that they've used quite a lot of uh, models covering the entire world, and they are not interested in one specific heat wave or extreme precipitation, but in all extreme cases that surpass those two, three uh, thresholds, okay? And so I'm going to show you results that put this type of extreme event uh, situation in terms of uh, uh, global warming, as you can see here below. So. This is the temperature uh, anomaly uh, prior to uh, pre-industrial period. We are currently here in 1.1, 1.2, okay? And you can see for hot extremes, the rise in the, that ratio. And you can see that for uh, uh, the 99 percentile, it's about four times more than, uh, frequent than before. But if you go to very extreme situations, it's up to 10 times more. Each line represents a different model, and the bold line is the uh, average of all the models, okay? Now, the fraction of uh, attributable uh, risk for the current climate shows that most of the heat waves would not occur if uh, we had uh, uh, temperature uh, closer to zero, but with 1.2, most, and I would say around 70% for this and 80 or even more for this type. Now think about the objectives in terms of uh, Paris Agreement and uh, 1.5 is completely impossible, but even two, when we talk about two, the probability of occurrence for very extreme situation in terms of heat will be 20, 30 times higher than what it is, what it used to be prior to the warming. Now, if you look into heavy precipitation, including stuff that you've seen in Turkey, China, and, uh, and uh, Germany, things are similar but very different. Uh, similar in, the th in terms of uh, higher values for the higher percentile, but very different in terms of uh, this uh, uh, ratio. So there's an increment, but only of 20, 30 percent, okay? And even with the uh, uh, additional warming, it will remain uh, pretty low. And what is uh, attributable to, to, uh, to climate change uh, is uh, fairly low. It's positive and it's increasing and it's higher for more extreme events. And in fact, we can summarize that uh, it increased non linearly for high levels of precipitation and heat and increased more for the stronger uh, streams. So, uh, what is the impact of this in terms of fires for Portugal and for the Mediterranean basin? Not good news, as you can imagine. And uh, we've published last year uh, something summarized for the entire Mediterranean basin using climate change scenarios for the coming decades we can summarize the influence of the meteorological variables in terms of fires for the entire Mediterranean, in terms of temperature, drought, wind speed, and uh, uh, relative uh, uh, air humidity using a standard PCA uh, principal component analysis. I won't go into many details, but I can summarize that for the three most important uh, mechanisms triggering uh, fires in the Mediterranean and 
these are hot, associated with drought, heat wave alone, and wind driven, that is very confined to specific areas with wind. If we look into these two, we can uh, see that this is predominant in Iberia and Northern Africa, and according to a mild and a very strong climate change scenario for the end of this century, these will increase significantly for both this situation and this additional situation. And interestingly, the heat wave one will increase more in uh, France, Northern Italy, as you can see here which is in agreement with some of the heat waves that I mentioned that were particularly strong in uh, Central uh, Europe. So, uh, of course, the, these uh, uh, the increments in terms of frequency of uh, very uh, powerful fires related with these mechanisms uh, will put an additional pressure in ecosystems and humans around the Mediterranean basin. Attention that these are again uh, changes in fire risk that do not take into account changes in terms of fuel. So vegetation will change also in accordance with changes in temperature and uh, precipitation and other variables. And you would need a more sophisticated uh, model taking into account the vegetation feedbacks. Right, to finalize, I want to stress that this is not confined to the Mediterranean uh, countries. This is enlarged to Western United States, to most of Australia, to South Africa, to large parts of South America. We've been working a lot with the Brazilian colleagues, and uh, I believe you noticed last year it was a catastrophic year for this Pantadal region, which is the largest, wettest region in the world. And everything you see here painted burn last year, uh, which is much more than the standard uh, area that usually uh, is burned every year. And why? Well, you can see quite easily here that the trend, the temperature, the maximum temperature trend is about 0.075 per decade. That means three degrees in four decades. This is outstanding. There is no ecosystem that will handle three degrees in four decades, okay? And you can see the, the annual values there, and it's be out of, we don't know where it's ending. And this year again, 2021, it's somewhere here again, okay? And of course, this is related with a tendency to dryness, which is depicted here by this index, and also this fire weather index that is rising. So even wet, areas such as Pantanal are showing this incredible tendency for dryness, increment in temperature, increment in uh, fire weather risk, which underlines this link between these uh, three uh, natural hazards. So I would say that the takeaway message here are uh, that no single climate extreme event results exclusively from anthropogenic influence in a deterministic sense but arise from this complex interaction between atmospheric land ocean uh, conditions. Now, very important for our air uh, region is that the Mediterranean uh, type climates, the frequency and amplitude of extreme events, including droughts, heat waves and fires are rising significantly. And we know that they are increasingly driven by climate change. The same cannot be said uh, as easily with in terms of extreme precipitation and floods that we know are expected to increase, but the role played by climate change is still relatively small, although it will grow in uh, near future. And that's it, thank you. So thank you, Ricardo, for helping us to, to understand better what is happening, which is not very good, but anyway, I don't know, there are no questions, but anyway, uh, someone can speak with you later on. Thank you very much. Um, so now, and moving to the next talk. So we learned that climate change and the effects that are associated with it are happening. And now we need to understand also how the species are adapting to this situation. And therefore, the next speaker, which is Patricia Beldad from the C3C, she's a, a professor at the Department of Animal Biology, 
is going to speak with us about the relevance of developmental plasticity in studies of the biological impacts in climate change. No, no, come on, kick it. So kick it. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. I want to start by thanking you for the opportunity to be here. It's been already a great day. I've learned so much. I also have, like the little blurb said in the beginning, a lot more questions that arose and that I'm looking forward to discussing with my colleagues. So we're moving now from, um, okay, I should be able to change this here. So today I'll be talking about the, the relevance of this particular property that uh, some, closer. Is this better? Oh, yeah. here and then I talk like that. <laughs> Maybe I'll just go back to feeling like oh. a dwarf behind the top. Sorry. Better? Okay, let's start. Okay, I can try to shout. Um, talking about a particular property that organisms have, which is to respond to the environment also in the way that they develop and that they produce a final phenotype and how that might be relevant to understanding the impact of environmental change, climate change, or other environmental perturbation in biological populations. So I'm part of the C3C, like Margarita was saying, which as you can see here, sort of the, the, the big, the bold, the brown, oh my gosh, what did I do? Okay, the brown lines are like theme lines. There's many different aspects of, of is it better? Yeah, sorry. The oh, yeah. Um, different aspects, different perspectives and, and, uh, and approaches to, to understanding the impact of climate change on biological populations. Um, uh, I am myself, I'm part of the Evolutionary Genetics Group, which is led by Vitor Souza, um, and it includes several PIs doing different things. I keep pressing this button, which I don't know what it's for. So I'm here. Echo, evo, devo, it sounds like a, a, a mouthful. But in fact, it's a sort of a new trend trying to integrate, not so new anymore, integrate both concepts and tools and approaches from different disciplines, ecology, developmental biology, evolutionary biology, to try to understand phenotypic variation and diversification. Um, variation has always been for me, the most fascinating property of biological systems. Wherever you look, whatever biological system there is, there will be variation. There are inter-individual differences for pretty much every phenotype. And suffice it to look around, we're all from the same species, pretty much the same geographical population, and we'll be different in all sorts of phenotypes that are visible to the eye and a lot of other phenotypes that we could measure when we go to the doctor or anything like that. So variation is a predominant feature of biological processes, okay? It is also the raw material for evolutionary change. It is if through heritable variation that we have evolution and uh, the creation of diversity across species through natural selection, but also artificial selection has derived the plants and the animals that we eat and use today in many aspects. Um, variation is obviously shaped by different processes. I'm pretty sure this does, oh yeah, even the non-biologists will know there's the process of mutation that introduces new genetic variants. There are the process of selection that filters phenotypic variation, making it that some phenotypes will increase in frequency across generations, other will decrease in fitness across generations. And then there's development that somehow reads genotypes and makes phenotypes. So it is important to consider all of these. And today I'll be mostly focusing on this aspect. All of these processes are deeply affected by the environmental conditions, okay? So the environment can determine different mutational rates and even different types of mutations occurring. The environment will obviously determine which are the phenotypes that are better adjusted and will increase in frequency. But the uh, environment will also affect development. And you have then this um, property, which is one of the things that I study, that is called, seriously, is it me? Okay, phenotypic plasticity, which is this property that the same exact genotype, so the same sequence of letters in the DNA, the ACs, TCGs, uh, under different uh, environmental conditions can produce completely distinct phenotypes. And I've been working on this along with other topics within Echo Evo Devo for a while now as a PI and in a, a, at the University of Lisbon um, since 2019. So I came in one semester before the pandemic hit us and put us all home. So it's been fascinating. 
uh, oops. Okay, so developmental plasticity, as I was telling you, refers to this property, same genotype, alternative phenotypes. It's very well known, for example, in the social insects, as I'm sure most of you will have heard, the difference between workers and queens, which is quite spectacular in terms of phenotype and of their roles in the colony, is to a large extent not dependent on any genetic differences, but rather how much or what they eat during development. Okay? The same is true for the difference between the, um, the, the isolate, uh, isolated or swarming uh, forms of this uh, desert locust, which has decimated many agricultural fields, and it was a huge problem a couple of years back, whether they produce the swarming uh, phenotype that has wings and flies away and likes to hang out other locusts versus the isolated form that does not have wings and tends to stay away from other uh, uh, individuals of the same species is largely dependent on whether they're developing at high densities versus low densities. So again, not something in their genotype, not something in their DNA, rather just the environmental conditions determining the production of different phenotypes. There's other examples. This dependence of developmental outcome, a phenotype, on the environment is typically represented by figures like this, which we call reaction norms. Okay? So you have phenotype as a function of the environment, and you can have many phenotypes or many organisms or many traits for which, regardless of what the environmental conditions are, they will produce a robust phenotype. So we call this robust development. It does not respond to environmental uh, uh, effects. Or you can have different types of, of plastic uh, responses, either a switch-like, where until a certain level of food you'll make a worker and after that you'll make a queen, something like that, where you have discrete alternative phenotypes or sort of more gradual and a classical would be the dependence of uh, body size on temperature for insects, okay? Um, I'm not going to go a lot into sort of a lot of has to happen so that you have the effect of an induct inductive environmental cue uh, on many uh, processes, cellular and, and molecular inside the organism, that it results in alternative phenotypes. What I wanted to say here, and I seem to have gone through two slides, um, is that for plasticity to be adaptive, that means to be a value for the organisms, the phenotype that is induced by the environment makes adults that are somehow better adjusted to the conditions they will experience later on. So there is some sort of a, a, a predictive relationship between the environmental cue that changes development and the environmental cue or the environments that are then what the organisms will live in and select them. So this is very obvious, for example, in cases of seasonal plasticity, where you find different morphologies or different behaviors in different seasons that are induced by the environment. So again, not genetic differences. They're adjusted to the particular conditions the seasons will happen. Um, this plasticity that is adaptive will obviously has the property of becoming maladaptive if somehow the correlation between whatever is the inducing cue and the selective environment is broken, okay? Because then you have the production of a phenotype that no longer matches the conditions that they will expose to later on. Okay. Um, I, I hinted already before, there's different types of cues that can induce changes in, develop in, in development and in developmental outcome, and temperature is obviously one of them, um, uh, and one that we study in the lab using this particular two uh, insect models. Insects, as ectoterms, meaning organisms that don't uh, self-regulate the temperature, are very much responsive to the external temperature. They kind of have to deal with it because they cannot adjust internally. And I use... Um, um, Two models, uh, a, a butterfly uh, species uh, for which we understand really well the ecological significance of developmental plasticity, and Drosophila melanogaster, which is kind of the um, genetic powerhouse of insects. Uh, it's a great system if we want to get at the molecular and the genetic mechanisms of what is happening. Um, okay, so how, how do we get here to climate change? And th this could also be... Um, to uh, environmental perturbation in general. So you can imagine in this uh, made-up continent that I've drawn here, okay? What we have is the colors reflecting some environmental gradient. It could be temperature, okay? And then I have these little letters here that represent uh, populations. Uh, uh, the letter itself represents a particular genotype, 
and the color of the letter represents a particular phenotype. So in this very simplified scheme of reality that I've drawn here, what you have is that you have genotype A that encodes a phenotype white that lives really well in that intermediate yellow to blue color, okay? So you can imagine, if now the situation changes and you have an alteration in the, in the temperature gradient and it's now much warmer and sort of the, uh, the at this position it's no longer that um, intermediate color, you can have either that populations move away, kind of they track the environment, that they track the conditions that are favorable to, to for their existence. This is obviously not possible or not as like, uh, likely in all species. You can also have the situation where you have adaptation, okay, so this, the population stays put, but now the phenotype white is no longer really suitable to live in those conditions, and you'll have natural selection making it that now you have the increase in the frequency of genotype C that corresponds to phenotype gray that lives well there, okay? And now, uh, in, uh, for the last uh, decade or so, a bit more, we've kind of consider started considering that maybe we need to uh, think of a third uh, solution to this problem, which is uh, uh, maybe given by phenotypic plasticity. So what the, s the, the scheme represents here is that you can now, because you can adjust your phenotype without having genetic changes, what I show here is a change in color without a change in letter. So you, in the same became phenotype gray, that is well uh, suited to living in these conditions, but you did not need to do that through genetic changes if you have plasticity. So this would be a way by which, because there's an intrinsic property that enables organisms to adjust their phenotype to the environment, that you could somehow, by time, or even stay in that location without having to wait for new mutations and for selection to take its action. Um, in fact, there's many examples of this happening in different species of insects, and these are just some of the examples here. Uh, we have examples of uh, phenotype tracking or plasticity playing a role, of habitat tracking, of genetic tracking. We also have sort of examples of a much sadder fate to biological populations where you have declines or and even extinctions. So back to the lab where I live. Uh, so we've been working on thermal plasticity and in particular developmental plasticity on, on, on these uh, two insects, also a little bit on ants, but that is nutritional plasticity, it's not thermal plasticity. So, uh, like most insects, you're larger if you develop at cooler temperature. You're larger and darker if you develop at cooler temperatures. And uh, we understand a little bit of the adaptive significance or the ecological significance of this property. Um, and today I wanted to tell you about where kind of more the recent work in the future, in, in very briefly, because I understand this is uh, not sort of a, to a specialized audience, much a broader audience. I've already learned so much today. Um, the way organisms react to changes in temperature or any other environmental perturbation is obviously variable itself, okay? So not all traits and not both sexes will respond in the same manner. There's differences between traits and there's differences between males and females and that can be relevant to understanding uh, what will happen to populations. Not all genotypes respond in the, t in the same manner. So what is a stressful temperature for particular genotypes in a natural population might not be a stressful temperature at all for other genotypes. So there will be genetic variation for how, how organisms deal with environmental perturbation. And finally, and very importantly, and it also connects to the previous talk, or the way an organism responds to a change in temperature might not be the same when there's also changes in other environmental variables. That means that the effect of different stressors or different environmental cues is not necessarily what we call additive. They might have interactions that are non-additive, either synergistic or some replacing others. So we do need desperately to understand how organisms respond okay to temperature, but taking into consideration uh, changes also in other environmental variables. Uh, yes, because natural populations are obviously complex. No single natural population is made of all individuals of the same genotype. No single natural population only has to deal with a change in temperature. Typically, there's going to be changes in all sorts of different environmental variables uh, together. And um, the intention here is not that you look at these figures in particular, it's kind of give you sort of a highlight or a, a, of a, a current interests that have to do exactly with that. 
how different genotypes, and here I represented about 190 genotypes of Drosophila melanogaster, that we could plot those reaction norms, and we see that they have different slopes, and that represents how different genotypes respond to temperature in different manners, and this matters um, also because um, this genetic variation is itself um, makes it lends itself to being selected and for having evolution of plasticity. We also have plasticity in traits, developmental plasticity in traits that maybe you wouldn't think would be so much affected by the developmental environment, would be more responsive immediately. And we already see here, this is a mortality curve, it doesn't really matter, but differences in males and females, whether there's thermal plasticity for immunity, for the ability to fight pathogens. And finally, this interaction between traits. So here we consider reaction norms um, for uh, different amounts of food and then measure those at different temperatures and you see that it's not always necessarily the same and it also varies between genotypes. So finally, I'm very excited that uh, um, hopefully the pandemic is gone and we can be back to uh, working as usual. And there's two projects about to start, a PhD student in the lab that will be looking at inter also looking at interactions between thermal plasticity in uh, immune challenge induced plasticity and a, a recent FCT project that hopefully will start in January looking exactly at this idea of complex environments. And uh, many thanks to um, many people and I think I'm over time so I'm gonna shut up now. No, you're in here. Thank you, Patricia, for the very nice talk. And now we move to, again, still in the life science uh, field, and uh, we call Andrei Figueret from BioEasy. She's going to speak us uncovering vineyard eating microbiome from regenerative agricultural practices to climate change adaptation. So we move now to adaptation. I forgot to say that she is a researcher from BioEasy. So good afternoon to you all. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the invitation to, for presenting a part of our work here today. So I'm tall, so I have to uh, just put this a little bit higher. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to present one of our research lines, the last one that we have implemented in our lab, which uh, is related to microbiome and its influence in plant fitness. So I cannot move. So this is strange for me. Okay. So as you all know, grapevine is one of the most important plants in the world because of berries, but particularly because of wine. And most of uh, you uh, should um, know its importance. And it is really one of the most uh, interesting models to work with, despite being a woody plant. So it's really challenging, but it's also very um, exciting to work with this, uh, with this model. So what do we know? We know that um, from the 70 more or less species that are described so far, only one is used for berry and wine production, which is Vitis vinifera. Vitis vinifera has over 10,000 different varieties and we are only using 30 of those 10,000 varieties. So there is a lot of genetic diversity here that is not exploited yet. And in fact, uh, grapevine development is associated to our own development and our own history. We have uh, several um, type uh, of historical, um, I cannot remember the word, but, uh, oh. We have historical connections to the development of several societies from the Egyptian ones to the others. And uh, we have here, domestication of grapevine occurring as well as we had the domestication of animals. In this case, Vitis vinifera subspecies sativa was domesticated from Vitis vinifera subspecies silvestris. And this one, as you can see here, has 
So this is compromising my way to, can you give me the other one? Because I cannot point here or this one. Thank you, Margarida. So I was telling you that in fact, all of this domesti domestication procedure uh, enable us to have higher and denser bunches of berries with a higher pulp and less seed. But it also bring here a kind of a genetic bottleneck on which we had a lot of traits that were related to plant fitness and adaptation to environment and to biotic and abiotic stressors that were compromised. So in fact, we are changing, we are facing several challenges from the ones associated to climate change as you could see in the first um, talk given by Ricardo, heat waves, water usage, loss of biodiversity and diseases. And in this case, we see that trends are changing. Uh, producers are more concerned about uh, all of the process of uh, production. So we are aiming at a recovery of biodiversity in the vineyards. And we are also looking at this gen genetic diversity uh, with the aim of using the most adequate uh, plant uh, varieties for each type of uh, climate um, needs. And in fact, I don't know if you are aware of it, but during grapevine development, so we are thinking more or less from February, March, where the first leaves get out, until the harvesting in late August, in the beginning of September, we have normally 14 to 15 pesticide application preventive ones. So in fact, there is a lot of agrochemical used in viticulture. This is one of the most polluting industries nowadays. And the conscious, not only of consumers, but also of producers and directive uh, organisms like European Union is coming forefront. And we have several new directives that oblige us to lower the pesticide usage. And in fact, I normally show this one. This is a study by DECU. Uh, it was made in 2016, if I'm not wrong. And they went to a supermarket, pick up a lot of bottles from biological wines to current wines, national wines, international wines. And you can see here the reds and the yellow dots, which are the wines that have pesticides and the red ones, pesticides above the limit that we can intake. So you can see this, that this is a major problem. There are several papers also focusing on berries that show the same trend. And in fact, there are guidelines from the, um, the regulatory um, uh, part of uh, grape and wine research that is leading us to think that functional biodiversity in the vine and in the recovery of soil diversity is really important and it's one of the things that we should take into account when we think of sustainability and sustainable production. And in fact, I will present you GPS lab. So uh, I'm the leader of the Grapevine Pathogen Systems Lab that was implemented in 2019 here in the campus. And we are a systems biology lab, so we focused on a particular biological model, in this case, grapevine interaction with pathogens, and we try to peel it off layer by layer into look in a biology, in a systems biology way. So we look from genes to transcripts to metabolites to proteins to phenotype, and now to microbiome also. And in this case, from all of our omics studies, we could identify several pathways that were really important when discriminating plant fitness to in, in tolerance to a biotic stress. And we were able to identify candidates that uh, we are validating now. So we perform both uh, fundamental research and applied research. And in this case, we have identified proteases, lipid signaling, some biomarkers that could be related to susceptibility or to resistance constitutively. So in the field, I look at the plants and I identify that compound and the plants that present that compound are probably more susceptible to the pathogen than the ones that don't present that compound. So I here can give some um, 
tools to the breeders that are trying to develop new crops that are resistant to pathogens. And we also uh, are starting to look at intra-varietal genetic diversity. So we are working close with our partners from uh, Dois Portos, which is the Portuguese ampliographic field that harbors all the genetic diversity of Portuguese traditional cultivars. And we are also contributing to the study of cultivar adaptation to different climate uh, regions. Later on, we start looking at the terroir concept and its influence on grapevine fitness and its ability to cope with, not only with climate change, but also with pathogen uh, attack. And we started look at, looking also to regenerative agriculture approaches and to functional microbiome. So when thinking about these three concepts, our latest research line uh, was uh, established in 2018. First, we two bios internal projects that, uh, in parallel with, uh, to, with the programs that uh, uh, FCUL is going to launch now, they require different fields of expertise to be accomplished to, uh, for the project submission. So we work close by with our um, MNG uh, unit and with BioEasy Genomics. And we uh, try to uh, work closely also with producers and to investigate if terroir, and I don't know if you are familiar with the concept, but terroir is a concept that tries to harbor all the adaptive climatic conditions, uh, geographical, climatic, sun exposure, uh, variety that tackles a specific wine. So normally terroir-based wines are very uh, expensive. And in this case, we intended to see also if soil microbiome could be responsible or could contribute for the definition of terroir. If each one of the terroirs that we were going to study presented different microorganisms that were considered to be biomarkers of the terroir. In this case, we work with Quinta dos Mursas. Quinta dos Mursas is uh, one of the first organic vineyards from uh, Spurão, from the wine company Spurão. Uh, it's in the Douro Valley, so uh, one of the uh, UNESCO British uh, regions. And they have eight different terroirs. We work with four. Reserva Vinhas Velhas, Margem and Subiu. Margem and Vinhas Velhas, uh, uh, produce two of the most expensive wines that they have uh, there now. They are mostly exported. And we also included a control wine with conventional agriculture methods, just to see whether or not, apart from terroir definition, we could distinguish between microbiomes in these two types of agriculture. So just let me uh, tell you also that when I started working with this project, one of the things that really captivated me was uh, when our colleagues told us that they went organic for almost 10 years and they were only able to get the certification two years ago. So it took them almost 10 years to prove that they had no pesticides in the soils, in the waters, in the plants and so on. So you can see that this is a real problem. So, um, what we knew? We knew that microbiome, soil microbiota was uh, important. And then we went to the farm and we collected soil samples at two different depths and in different locations. And we used this amazing, this amazing technology that we have here in the campus, which is a long read nanopore uh, sequencing that allowed us to have a huge uh, sequencing depth and uh, a read of all of the things that were in the soil uh, f far beyond what we could have with conventional methods, sequencing methods. So we had problems, uh, of course we were implementing the technology and the analysis pipeline. So one of the main problems that we faced were um, the identification of the OTUs. And for that, our colleagues from BioEasy Genomics developed uh, an in-house pipeline um, and an in-house database that allow us to have a higher cover coverage of uh, OTU identification. 
and but we have here some some of the numbers so 11 million reads over 8,000 OTUs or taxonomical units that were identified and we had virus identified in solid. So this was really unexpected and really exciting for me to see that we could cover so deep that we found virus genomes and we covered virus genomes, almost 4,000 virus genomes different. And in fact, we were able to distinguish between that we were able to distinguish the microbiome between seasons, so July and September. We could find markers for July and markers for September. We could find markers that were associated to specific terroirs, and we are now, this is under preparation, but we are now looking for the differences between the terroirs and the, produ the, the production in an organic way and the one that is conventional to see if we can clearly, clearly measure also the impact of agriculture practices in this type of uh, analysis. So it was so interesting and we had so much success in the implementation of all of these technologies that last year we were awarded with a, last year, yeah, this year, we were <laughs> awarded with a Prima project, so an international project. This international project uh, is led by our Italy partners and arbors Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Tunisia, Portugal and France. In Portugal we are the PIs here at FCUL and our main aim is to study and to prove that the use of regenerative agriculture practices leads to microbiome changes, leads to a higher soil productivity and to a higher soil fertility, and that, that alteration will impact the plants, will impact the production, and will also impact the way that plants cope with environmental stressors, climate change, heat waves, the way that they use water, because it is known already that there are some microorganisms that are associated with roots and enable plants to have a higher um, efficiency of water usage. So we intend to see also if we can manufacture that. And um, our team here at the campus um, comprehends two uh, different um, research centers, Mari and BioEasy. We have also a partner from Sevilla University. And we have, as our Portuguese partners, INIAF, the National Institute of Agrarian and Veterinarian Investigation, and AVIP, so uh, Associação de Produtores de Palmela, de Viticultores de Palmela. What are our main tasks here and what are we going to do? We are going to develop new biofertilizers and biostimulants, so we are going to test some microorganism consortia and some microalgae to see whether or not we can influence plant fitness and if we can use that consortia as biocontrol agents for some pests. We are going to help our colleagues from INIAV to assess the Portuguese grapevine gen germoplasm and to select the ones that are most adapted to some of the uh, experimental, um, sorry? No, not much. We are going also to evaluate biotic and abiotic resilience of some uh, of the cultivars that we have present in the ampelographic field. And in the end, we are going to see the effect of all that we are doing in terms of soil microbiota. And we are going to check whether or not, in fact, we can contribute to a better viticulture. So, of course, that science is a collaborative, is done in a collaborative way. Uh, here I acknowledge all of our partners in this research line and our project uh, refined partners also. This is the GPS group. So, uh, my students and Rita, which is the postdoc, if you want to know a little bit more about us, uh, you can check our websites. And my take home message for you is this one. So, we are what we eat. So we have to, um, we have here kind of a, a struggle that we should take in science to cope with this type of challenges and to gain more sustainability in the production of food.
Thank you. So time to coffee break. Uh, we invite you all to meet here again in 13 minutes. Yes.
And we are going to continue it with life sciences and with uh, um, um, biological systems. This time is Alice Nunes that is going to speak. She is a researcher at the C3C and she's going to, to speak about promoting the resilience of agroforestry system to climate change, ensuring ecosystem functions and services. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon to everybody. Um, today, I, I brought here uh, a part of the research work that we have been doing related with promoting the resilience of agroforestry systems to climate change. And let me just change the, my hand. So, starting by a very uh, general overview, we can see here the map of the extent of global agriculture around the world. And now we'll be talking about the specific type of agriculture, which, uh, is, um, which are these agroforestry uh, systems. That in its basic definition, these are agricultural lands, but they have, that have more than 10% of uh, uh, tree cover. And these agroforestry systems that we've been hearing more and more to talk about, they are quite important because uh, mainly they, by integrating um, the um, woody vegetation, mostly trees, with crop production and also sometimes with livestock production, they take benefit of this interaction, this ecological and economic interaction between these activities. And this is why most of these systems are actually providing a wider variety of goods and ecosystem services than do agricultural lands per se or forestry lands exclusively. So they represent 43% of all agricultural land areas globally. And uh, because of these features of combining different activities, they are often associated with high conservation values. And now uh, we jump to these agroforestry systems. And now I would like to talk about some areas that are occupied by these agroforestry systems. And these particular areas are drylands. This is because we've, we've been developing most of our work in these uh, dryland areas, not only in Portugal, but in other parts. But today I will speak mostly about the examples from Portugal. Um, so these drylands are specific areas because, well, these are areas when the precipitation is low, and so it does not compensate for the evaporative demands uh, that are imposed by high temperatures, and so these are naturally water-limited areas. And this makes these areas quite prone to uh, desertification, which is uh, land degradation that is caused not only by these climatic constraints that we find in drylands, but also, of course, associated with the type and intensity of land use that we make in these areas. So this leads to this desertification. And because I will be talking mainly about what we've been doing in Portugal, I would like to highlight, sorry, that uh, most of the Mediterranean basin is occupied by drylands and also that these areas are highly susceptible to climate change because, um, because of their characteristics and we are expecting an overall increase in aridity in drylands. And so what we should be expecting for the Mediterranean basin and actually are already um, facing uh, are these, has been, as has been told in the previous uh, communication, a decrease in precipitation or change in precipitation regimes, increased droughts, increasing water demand for agriculture, uh, higher risk in livestock production, and so on. And so we have to face these challenges and try to cope with them as much as possible. And uh, now I jump to the particular case of Portugal. So I don't know, perhaps most of you are aware that uh, the uh, dryland areas in Portugal are mostly concentrated in the, south of, in the southern part of the country and also a bit in the uh, northeast. And as you can see from these maps, we have been already facing an increase in aridity over the last decades. And this increase in aridity is mostly threatening the type of ecosystems that dominate here in the southern part of the country, which are oak woodlands, dominated by cork oak and by oam oak. I guess most, many of us are familiar with this type of ecosystems, agroforestry ecosystems that we call montado. Um, montados are very, are remarkable ecosystems. They are quite important because 
they provide different types of ecosystem services, and we are not talking only about the most obvious ones, cork extraction, livestock production, and so on, but they play a very uh, essential role in regulating services like soil conservation, water, um, water regulation, and also pest control. And of course, for many of us, they have a high cultural importance because we are uh, uh, used to these uh, beautiful landscapes and for other reasons as well. And of course, in the basis, we have these uh, ecosystem processes like primary productivity and nutrient cycling. Despite the high importance of these ecosystems, which harbor a remarkably high biodiversity level, they are under threat. And this is not only because of climate change, but, but as I said, because climate change effects coupled with the uh, intensity of land use and the type of land use that we choose to have on these areas. And so we are now witnessing low natural re regeneration of oaks and also a high mortality of adults. So we're losing oaks, which is a key feature of this type of ecosystems. And also in many cases, we are uh, witnessing a uh, loss in biodiversity values and also low productivity. And this has not only economic, but also not only ecological, but also economic consequences. For instance, in the productivity of pastures for livestock production. And so we've been trying to understand what has been, um, which are the consequences of this climate change for this type of ecosystems, for montados. And before, I, uh, uh, before we jump to some examples of the research we do, I would like to highlight two features of the methods that we use to study these ecosystems and the effect of climate change. So the first feature I would like to highlight is that we usually we use ecological indicators uh, that uh, are tools that uh, allow us to measure the health condition of the ecosystem. Uh, they may be based on different types of organisms but uh, at, at different scales, but even when we use the tiniest ones, in some cases, we are able to upscale this type of information, for instance, using remote sensing data. And when that is the case, we may be able to map uh, as well the uh, uh, ecosystem health condition over space and over time, which is quite useful. Another feature I would like to highlight about the methods we use is, um, well, of course, to study climate change in the ecosystems, of course, we need to witness this change in climate. And uh, because in many cases we do not have s this long-term data, a common approach is to study spatial climate gradients, uh, assuming that they will mimic what will happen over time due to changes in climate. But of course we know that uh, what happens in the same site over time is dependent on the characteristics of that site. For instance, on its soil, topoidific characteristics, uh, climatic legacy and so on. So in many cases we also study, we have to validate this, this spatial approach by studying the same site over time and see what happens. Besides these empirical and uh, observational studies, we also have manipulative studies, which are in fact the ones that more directly gives us, give us a cause-effect relationship. Um, uh, for instance, these uh, experiments of um, reducing precipitation in a certain amount, the precipitation that falls in a certain area. So, uh, now let's jump to some examples about our studies done with spatial climatic gradients. Uh, so, in this case I brought here, we were studying uh, Montado ecosystem and its response to aridity. Therefore, we chose several sites occupied by Olmo Montados, uh, along from, from wetter sites to drier sites, avoiding as much as possible other confounding variables. And so we studied the plant community in these, uh, in these areas. And we looked at the plant community not only uh, from the taxonomic point of view, the, the species A, B or C that are present in different abundances, but we also looked at plant features plant functional characteristics that actually reflect the role that the plants play uh, at the level of the ecosystem function. And so we found different, um, different functional, tra functional traits that were changing with aridity, but what I would like to highlight is that with this information, we were able to build a multi-trait functional diversity index that actually showed a, a monotonic, non-linear decrease 
with increasing aridity, despite the, the, the noise that we see here. This indicates us somehow that above a certain aridity threshold, um, some of the ecosystems are uh, losing part of its function. Uh, and so these type of models can help us how? For instance, to build maps, uh, maps of the areas at risk, at higher risk of desertification or loss of ecosystem services. And this information may be useful, useful for land managers, policy makers, to focus on that area, uh, on that areas uh, to implement mitigation strategies, restoration efforts to uh, decrease the intensity of land use or change it. Okay, this is a type of application of these types of models that can also inform other, for instance, uh, other conventions of desertification, biodiversity, and so on. Now I will jump to another example where we've been studying climate gradients uh, over space. Uh, in this case, we were interested, as I told you, uh, we are losing oaks, cork oaks and oam oaks. And so uh, we have been having several uh, funding programs that have been financing uh, afforestations or reforestations with oaks. So the idea is to promote oaks uh, and to combat desertification. And sometimes these oaks are, in, um, are planted alone and in other situations, they were planted with umbrella pines. Allegedly, the, the pines would facilitate the establishment of oaks. And so this has been done for many years, more or less using the same recipe. And the question is, do we know which are the best solutions, which are the, which are the most successful from different points of view? And we, cannot, we do not have an answer to this question. And so our idea was to study these reforestations, once again, in different levels of aridity, uh, we looked at different, as different um, characteristics, such as the oak natural generation, productivity of the system, soil quality, and so on. And I'll just s summarize very briefly some of the most important results. So we found out that um, pines were not bringing any beneficial effect for oak natural regeneration. So they would not be needed for that. Also that in terms of habitat complexity, oak-dominated reforestations were able to harbor potentially a more diverse biodiversity. They, ha they, they have a higher habitat complexity. In terms of productivity, when we compared reforestations with the same age, we found out that uh, oaks grew more without pines. Well, we can, could discuss this in more detail, but uh, and in terms of soil quality, pile, pines did not show uh, a relation with soil quality, which was more related with aridity. So therefore, we should question what are the pines doing there, if they make sense, and in which conditions they make sense. Just to give you some examples. We evaluated other features of these reforestations, but the main lessons learned were that we should adapt the reforestation type to the specific objectives we had for a certain area, and also with the context of that area in terms of climate, topographic variation, and choose different solutions with higher spatial precision for different areas and not applying the same recipe all over in very, very uh, large areas, as we've been doing all these years. Uh, and this could be an effective way of adapting to climate change. Well, let's, let's now jump for some examples of studies that we do over time. Uh, uh, this, the, the results of this work are in this ebook that is available online if you want to see it later. So I brought here, uh, from studies over time, I brought here an example of uh, work that has, has been led by my colleague, Diana Prisp. So what she did very briefly was she used aerial photographs to study the same area over time and to, um, to model the rate of oak natural regeneration over time. Uh, and to do this model, she used several predictors from climate variables, topographic variables, and what she found out was that uh, microclimates, so topographic variables, were very, very important for these rates of oak natural regeneration. And this is quite important because we may be able to predict where uh, natural, regeneration, natural regeneration is more likely to occur at a faster rate, and so decide where we should invest our efforts in replanting oaks, for instance. And besides that, this model was also very su successful predicting the, um, the success or unsuccess of some of the plantations that were already done in that area. Some of them were done more than once because all the trees died. 
And if we know where the implementation and the establishment of these logs will be more difficult, we should uh, assist these reforestations with irrigation, with providing shadow, and so on, to improve the success of these reforestations at high spatial scales. Finally, other example I, told, I, I brought about uh, uh, studying responses over time. So in the same areas, uh, some of the areas that we studied with Montados, we studied them over uh, climatically contrasting years, so over time. And uh, the, the idea here is to, uh, to be able to study the resilience of the plant community to these fluctuations in, uh, in, in, uh, in climate over years uh, and to be able to uh, propose adaptation measures to deal with it. Uh, I, I just brought here some examples of the, of the field work because in ecology this is all, all, all a very important part of our work. And regarding these studies over time, I just brought here a simple graph well, that shows here we have the long-term precipitation of the sites that we study, okay, over here. Uh, and what we found out was that historically wetter sites have higher functional diversity of this uh, trait, which is onset of flowering. They have higher functional diversity than historically drier sites. At the same time, wet years have higher functional diversity than dry years. And despite all the variation that we see here in drier sites, we can see that after uh, a dry year, uh, they are able to recover its functional diversity at least to a certain extent if a wet year comes after that. But we do not know how long they will uh, keep this resilience of recovering in wet years. That is why we are studying this uh, over many years uh, to to be able to find those uh, thresholds that will likely occur because we are expecting uh, several dry years in a row as a consequence of climate change. Okay. So finally, uh, the last example about some manipulative studies we've been doing. In this case, we've, um, we are installing them in Le Terre Montado sites, which are uh, sites where we're conducting long-term ecological research. They make part of an international network at sites, and in this case we chose Compañía das Lesírias, Herdade de Ribeira Abaixo, which is the field station of CUL, uh, of C C3C, uh, and also um, Herdade da Coitadinha, in Barrancos, to install these, uh, these uh, uh, drought experiments. So we are following, we following here an international uh, drought experiment protocol, to enable to compare our results with the others from other countries as well. And we are uh, reducing precipitation by 50% and also making an extreme drought treatment. Um, and the idea is to see the consequences for the plant community, for the, the, the herbaceous plant community, uh, subject to these treatments. And so we already chose the areas that we are studying in the different properties. Uh, we've done the, the baseline sampling this spring and we are in the phase of installing these rainout shelters. Uh, which has been quite challenging as well. Last slide is just to give you the exa some examples of outputs that we're getting from these projects. So besides publishing in, uh, in, uh, in papers, in, in journals of the area, for instance, uh, related to land use policy, to uh, forest ecology, ecological indicators, agriculture, we've been also participating in uh, science reports which are very, very, very important to transfer the knowledge we get for, to the society. I also highlight this uh, climate change adaptation plan that we done to Mertula, which is at the very core of the Simieri there is in Portugal. And of course, this was done also because we had uh, many, um, many meetings with different types of stakeholders from municipalities, NGOs, landowners, and so on. And this is really a dialogue that is important to keep uh, and to nurture the, the kind of research we do, we do and also to transfer that knowledge to society. And that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. And, and now we move from land to the sea. There will be much more to say about land, but we, <laughs> we have no time, so we move to sea. And the next speaker is... Uh, Pedro Granadeiro, 
and he's going to speak to us about the global phenological insensitivity to shifting ocean temperatures. He's, uh, he's a professor at the Department of Animal Biology, and he, he belongs to CESAM, Sciences. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation. Congratulations on keeping this great initiative. Um, of course, I couldn't miss the opportunity, opportunity to make a little bit of publicity about my preferred research model, which are birds. So that's exactly where we'll be starting. To say that birds are complex creatures. They are endotherms, so they control their own temperature. They come with a variety of colors and shapes and size and all that, so they are very attractive uh, animals. Uh, they occur almost everywhere on Earth, at least on the main ecosystems, from the poles to the equators to desert areas, even in urban ecosystems, so everybody knows birds. And, of course, they are very, very popular, which means that they are relatively easy to study, not as difficult as mammals, so to say, for instance, um, so they, they are a very convenient group for research. And another thing is that there is a lot of information about birds that comes not only from scientists, but also from citizen science. science. So to a lot of extent, it's a very convenient research topic, research model, um, apart from being very nice. Of course, like all other organisms on Earth, they are affected by climate change. And temperature is, in fact, the factor that affects them most. Most of the creatures are very dependent on temperature. So I will be focusing, focusing on, on that. And we, I will refer to the three main um, effects that have been reported in, in birds in relation to, to the changes in temperature. So first of all, uh, birds are getting smaller. Birds are getting smaller, despite being complex organisms, they're getting smaller, or at least some species, and their appendage, appendages are also getting larger. Well, this has to do with um, increased heat dissipation, because in doing this, uh, their, the, the relationship between their area and uh, their vo volume actually increases, so they can dissipate um, energy uh, more efficiently. This seems a little bit trivial, but it can, has, it can have a lot of consequences. This is a study published in Science, and this is the knot. It's a shorebird that breeds in the Arctic, and then it migrates to wetlands in, uh, the, tropical, uh, in, in the tropical areas. So what has been observed is that the size of the knots are decreasing, and their build size is also decreasing. So the thing is, when they arrive to the wetlands to feed on their bivalves, which are buried in the sediment, now they are, they are struggling to reach their preferred prey, which is also the most profitable for prey. And if you look at the, the, the graph on your left, you see that the survival is getting low, low, very low in relation to the um, other size classes. So this is a, a problem that is generated uh, uh, globally, but it has consequences, very severe consequences for the fitness of individuals. Now, the second effect, which is most commonly, uh, commonly uh, spoken of, is that birds in, uh, are, are going up the mountain, so to say. So their distribution, they are tracking the temperatures in mountain ranges, so they are going up and up and up. So the first thing is, of course, that their distribution area is getting smaller because they are, they are reaching the top, and once they are there, they no longer can no longer expand their distribution. But also, they are trapped in these continental islands, so the gene flow decreases quite significantly, which has uh, obvious consequences for uh, their probability of extinction. So this is also a problem. But also, their range distribution over the continents is also changing. Now, we used to think that, well, all animals are going polewards. They are going on the north uh, hemisphere, they are going further north. On the southern hemisphere, they are going further south to track the temperatures. But actually, the picture is much more complex than that because temperature interacts with a lot of other things like humidity, like topography, like habitats, like vegetation, and so on. 
So birds are moving everywhere. That's the problem. And so the, the, the communities are getting mixed at an uh, unprecedented rate. So species that have never been in contact are now getting in contact. So communities are reshuffled alongside their parasites, for instance, and their diseases and so on. So that is also uh, a problem. Now the third problem, which I will focus now, is phonology. So for those unfamiliar with that term, phonology refers to the cyclic events in the, the, the life cycle of organisms. Um, not with us, of course, but birds, as well as other animals, have specific laying dates, specific dates to start migrations, to specific dates to arrive from the migratory trips, um, and, and so on. <clears throat> we all notice that uh, in Portugal, for instance, the swallow are coming earlier and earlier each year. We now see swallows in January or February. We, that, that we, we, didn't, we never saw that again. Uh, we have never saw that b before. And of course, they are also laying earlier because spring is uh, 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 getting earlier. So this is these are not our swallows, but these illustrate exactly that phenomenon. So swallows are laying their eggs earlier. So what? What's the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, phonology of the predators and of the prey have to be very well synchronized because it has evolved to be so. So take the great teeth, for instance. The great teeth have a specific day of hatching their chicks because when the chicks require the most energy, that's when the caterpillars, which are their prey, are at their highest abundance. So we have a perfect match, a high synchrony between the availability of prey and the requirements of their predators. Now, we know that a lot of species are changing their phenology, particularly prey. So what happens then if the predator cannot adjust their phenology? Well, we have what we call the phenological mismatch, phenological trophic mismatch, in which the birds, in this case, will be trying to raise their chicks under very unfavorable conditions. <clears throat> so we get to our research and the topic I would like to, 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 to speak about. So we study these in seabirds and we study the, the, the variation temporal of whether the seabirds were changing their phonology in relation to changing temperatures. So the work is actually a large international collaboration of a lot of, of people from a lot of, of sites. Um, well, let me speak about seabirds first, I'm sorry. Uh, seabirds are very interesting uh, uh, animals, first of all, because, because they make these spectacular uh, colonies like the one, this one, which in which we work in the South Atlantic, um, and and also because they are so tame, we can study their phenology with very a very high degree of detail, and also many of them breed in oceanic islands. So that issue of moving around and shifting their distribution is to to a certain extent controlled. So they are good models to study this phenological uh, um, problem. <coughs> So the, our work is actually, as I said, a large international collaboration, which is a gathering of huge amount of data on phonological variation over time of seabirds belonging to these five major uh, orders of, of birds. Okay, so we compile information from birds species with very different ecologies, very different sizes, very different locations. <coughs> And uh, so this is the, 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 the colonies that were studied, belong to uh, around 60 species, 120 something populations, time very long time series of phonological data, mostly laying dates and hatching dates, and I'll be speaking only about laying dates. And what we did was to see whether the phonology changed in relation to the change of sea surface temperature, because we know the sea surface temperature influences the, the abundance of their prey. So what we wanted to see was whether across time, there the, the birds have anticipated their phenology, have kept them constant, or have changed it to uh, breed, uh, to, to make chicks hatching later. So the first result is not truly exciting. It shows that at the colony sites, actually the temperature of the sea 
has shown a positive trend. So the sea is warming. Everybody knows that, but it's confirmed with this study, um, which just considered the areas around the main columns that we included in this, this study. This is particularly so in temperate regions, also in tropical regions and in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. So the most striking result actually is that as a whole, seabirds are not moving their phenology. So despite the fact that the sea is changing and the temperature is increasing, seabirds are apparently unable to change their schedule. So they are keeping their laying dates and their hatching dates more or less constant. Well, when we look at the graph, we see, well, but there are some outliers. There are some, some, some points that some species seem to be anticipating their, their, their uh, hatching dates. So is this to do with, the with temperature? Oops, sorry. No, it has not. So regardless of the direction of change in, in the sea surface temperature, seabirds are actually unable to change their schedule of laying, which is a problem for the trophic mismatch. So in conclusion, what we can say now with this very long and comprehensive study is that seabirds are unwilling or unable to adjust their timing to in this changing world. In fact, the change are very, very modest in relation to what we observed in birds in, in terrestrial habitats. And this probably has to do with the fact that seabirds um, have very long development periods. For instance, some seabirds take more than two months to incubate their egg, more than three months to raise their chick. So there is very little leeway to, to adjust their, their annual calendar, if, if you want. And what we also know is that many of their prey are changing meanwhile. So there is, they are at this very high risk of trophic mismatch. So they are unable to move on a very, on a fast moving world, which is of course a problem. And it's a problem that adds to many other threats that they have elsewhere, including persecution, uh, interaction with fisheries and so on. So given that we are, have been unable to do very much of significance in relation to climate change, I think we have to tackle these more direct threats to avoid the extinction of this, of this very iconic group of creatures that live in the oceans. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Zé Pedro. So what we thought it was a good news, at the end is not so good as well. So we keep with the sea and we are now uh, listening to Caterina Brazão Santos, and she's more, uh, she's going to speak about integrating climate change in ocean planning. Caterina, queres falar de nós? So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for so much for the opportunity to be here and to share a bit of the work that we have been developing on how to integrate climate change into marine spatial plans. And so today I will uh, talk briefly about the work that we have been developing and the study that we published last year and that explores the links between ocean planning, climate change, and ocean sustainability, and that was published on nature sustainability. <laughs> and this was developed under Project Ocean Plan, uh, a project that counts with many members from Ciencias and Mare, but also many members from other top institutions in the US, Germany, France, and Italy. And we all have been working collaboratively for the past five years. Uh, so, um, and so for those who are not as familiar with marine spatial planning, what this is, is simply a way to organize the use of the ocean space. So which activities go where and when. And the ultimate goal is to support sustainable development. So we need to achieve both ecological, economic and social objectives. This is the goal. And for that reason, marine spatial planning has been pointed out 
as a vital tool or approach to support sustainable development goals, namely life below water. And so marine spatial planning has been expanding. We now have initiatives in about 75 countries around the world, some in more advanced uh, stages, some of them just beginning, and this will keep expanding for the next 10 years or so at least. But still, there are many challenges in the development and implementation of ocean plants. And on top of these challenges, and with high potential to exacerbate them, we find climate change. So climate change has been recognized as a challenge for many years now, but probably never as much as today. We see that the ocean is getting warmer, more acidic, with less oxygen, we are losing sea ice, uh, extreme events are being more frequent, and all of these will cause changes in marine ecosystem structure and functioning. We see that species are redistributing, <laughs> Uh, we are losing biomass. And so the services and the benefits that are provided by these ecosystems are changing and this will affect human activities like fisheries or aquaculture or tourism or even marine conservation because it is a use of the ocean space. But other activities like shipping or uh, seabed mining or renewable energy production will also be affected by changing ocean conditions like winds and currents and also increased danger at sea. So different uses will be affected different ways and also depending on the region that we are considering. But what we know for sure and this is a drawing by, by Bas Kohler, a visual artist that makes some amazing uh, cartoons. What is for sure is, is that the way that humans use the ocean and benefit from the ocean are changing and will continue to change. So we may find new conflicts between uses, new environmental pressures, new legal issues because a lot of these uses require use permits to take place, and all of these will affect marine spatial planning. However, climate change tends to be neglected in ocean plants. And why is this important, you may ask? Well, first, because if we have plants that operate in a changing ocean, properly addressing and integrating climate effects is vital to keep these plants viable, relevant, and sustainable in the long term. And second, and most importantly, because if we build climate uh, smart ocean plants, ocean plants that consider climate uh, information, they in, in, the, in themselves, they can contribute to climate adaptation and climate mitigation. So how can we support the development of climate smart marine spatial planning? So through the analysis of several studies, we identify these four key steps. First, recognizing the problem, then integrating knowledge on climate impacts, then supporting adaptation and mitigation actions, and finally, supporting flexible and adaptive planning. So recognizing the importance of the challenge may seem obvious and basic, but it is not. It is the first step so that we can develop climate smart ocean plants. And why? Because when plans and policies and strategies address climate change only in a very vague and general way, what happens is that the challenge is not properly addressed in actions and management measures. So we need this. Then we need to integrate knowledge on climate impacts. And how? There are several ways and tools. One of them is by using modeling and mapping tools, and these can pertain to identifying areas where marine ecosystems will undergo bigger change or using global projections to identify expected changes in ocean uses like fisheries or aquaculture or shipping. These are, are actually um, examples of studies that do this. But we can also use species distribution modeling to assess areas that are more prone to change. As this is the example of a study conducted last year in the US where they use about a thousand projections for marine animals to assess how relevant ocean current plants are and how sustainable they can be to the future. We can also use vulnerability and risk analysis 
So not only identifying spatial temporal changes in ecosystems and uses, but also knowing where the consequences of such changes are most significant. We have an example in Maria, French Polynesia, where they used the assessment of social ecological vulnerability of small scale um, fisheries to support the national marine spatial plan. Or in the US, where the assessment of cumulative risk of human activities towards marine habitats was used to support two planning regions. But we can also use a process called visioning or the creation of spatial use scenarios. So these scenarios are imagined futures and they are used to select management alternatives. And when building these scenarios, those tools, those maps, those vulnerability analysis can be uh, used and integrated into the scenarios to support the selection of uh, management alternatives of, of different planning options. And this is an example from the Western Tropical Pacific where the creation of visions for MSP um, was supported by the development of climate change scenarios, both optimistic and catastrophic, developed by stakeholders in a co-creation process. So with this information, we can then support climate adaptation and mitigation actions through MSP. First, because MSP, Marine Spatial Planning, provides a holistic way to look at the management area. And this is fundamental to ensure that when we take an uh, adaptation measure towards one sector, it is not maladaptive towards another. Then, MSP also has the potential to support ecosystem resilience by decreasing other non-climate related pressures, such as pollution, for example. MSP also has the potential and ability to allocate space for the protection of key areas with marine, key marine species and marine uh, habitats, or even by identifying and protected areas known as climate refugia, areas that are less prone to change. But we can also contribute through MSP to empowering human populations and increasing social resilience to climate change by raising awareness on climate impacts, promoting ocean literacy, and fostering the participation of local actors and local communities in identifying solutions. This is the side of adaptation, but if we go, and, and most people agree on that, when we go to the ways on which MSP can contribute to climate mitigation, there are more controversy, but this is a, a key point. MSP can contribute to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, for example, by supporting the expansion of marine renewable energy, promoting a more efficient allocation of space to this use, decreasing conflicts with other uses, and better explaining why it is important to support this. But marine spatial planning can also support blue carbon capture and storage by protecting blue carbon ecosystems or by allocating space to other types of ocean-based carbon dioxide removal initiatives. For example, large scale production of seaweed. And ultimately, marine spatial planning, because it deals with the spatial allocation of uses, it can prioritize the attribution of those permits, those legal permits, to ocean uses that tend to use eco-efficient technologies and power sources that tend to zero emissions. After all this, and even taking into account all the best tools, the best models, the best analysis, we all always have to take into account that there's a level of uncertainty involved. So we will always need to create pathways to ensure flexible and adaptive planning to deal with that uncertainty. And this can be supported through, for example, dynamic ocean management, a type of management that uses real-time data to support boundaries that are dynamic. And this, we have cases, uh, practical cases, where this is done for fisheries management in the US and Australia, 
and also aquaculture, but other examples exist for shipping and conservation. And recently, last year, there was a paper on science about the potential for these areas to be used for conservation in the high seas. So this is a, a hot topic. Uh, much debate is going on around, around the potential of these areas. We can also use anticipatory zoning, which is the a priori um, allocation of space to a given use or to the exclusion of a given use in anticipation of climate effects. And we have examples in the Arctic where there are areas that were closed to commercial fishing in advance of expected sea ice loss using the status of marine protected areas. And finally, we have the more traditional adaptive management and adaptive governance approaches that are approaches based on learning by doing and adjusting actions according to results. And these are conceptually embedded in marine spatial planning. However, there are a lot of challenges, legal challenges many times, that prevent this adaptation cycle to be fully concluded and this needs to be overcome. So it is very important to develop climate smart ocean plans. There are a lot of challenges, but good news is that the topic is getting more and more attention. For the past two years, a lot of initiatives and sessions and um, reports came out mentioning this, this, um, this needed uh, approach to MSP. Papers are also uh, being published on the topic more frequently. For example, this particular one published in Science Advances also last year uh, makes an analysis uh, and, and advocates that while provi providing substantial benefits, climate smart ocean plans may require a few trade-offs. And this is very good. But further discussion is still needed with policymakers, lawmakers, planners, managers, local communities, and still the scientific community. And through ocean plan, we are contributing to this. Some of the, the sessions that uh, I mentioned in the previous slide were uh, organized by uh, ocean plan partners and the team. And last year, we conducted a global survey to collect opinions from experts that reached 50 countries. And we are now working on those results. And we are very happy that the science we produce already um, paved way and contributed to policy documents that were launched this year. The first a policy brief on climate change and marine spatial planning developed by the UNESCO and European Commission. And more recently, a roadmap to integrate uh, clean offshore renewable energy into climate smart ocean planning that is being developed by the United Nations Global Compact, and we have been contributing and provide, providing advice to it, and that will be launched and discussed next week in COP26. So this is, we are very happy with providing this bridge between science and policy, and actually using the science that we develop to uh, promote action and management. So, Thank you so much. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can let me know afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. I don't know if I said that Katerina is a researcher at Smare. Sorry for that. So now we move from Earth to other planets but still keeping the topic about changing atmospheres. And we have the talk of Pedro Machad from the Institute of Astrophysics that is going to speak to us about how this change their ability. Thank you, Pedro. Pedro is from the Institute of Astrophysics. First of all, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you to Ciencias for the invitation and for the opportunity to share with you our ongoing science and prospects. So, uh, astrophysics can provide extreme cases and help to put in context what is happening on Earth. Also, I think it's important for comparison, I will uh, cope with that in some cases along this presentation. Well, 
Let, let's have a look at that four planets that you saw before in the square are the only four cases with uh, Earth-like, Earth-type atmosphere in hydrostatic equilibrium. So Venus, Earth, Mars, and Titan, that is a moon from Saturn. Here, what you see, and these numbers are important, but I will uh, ask you for um, joining me in, I will pinpoint some numbers that are important. So let's start with Venus and Earth. So, come on, these planets on, on the planet, on the solar system, they were formed more or less at the same time and from the same material from the protoplanetary nebula. So same time and same bricks, I would say. So it's expected as an educated guess that the primordial atmospheres and structure and density and, and so would be quite similar in the primordial planets. However, the evolutionary past, the temporal evolution, it's utterly different. Let's see why. At least, of course, there are some open questions that we want to tackle uh, also with our, our research. But let's see first here that Venus and Earth have more or less same size, more or less same density, the distance to the sun, it's s around 70% uh, for Venus than the, the distance for Earth. But after, the, what is similar for now, these days is totally different. So let's see the solar constant from the beginning is almost a double. This is one thing that I, I ask you to keep in mind. Second, you see the surface temperature, 460 degrees for Venus at surface? Wow. And the super superficial pressure, it's 92 bars, almost like being one kilometer deep in the ocean, the pressure is huge. Wow. Let's now look to the uh, composition. And f f again, the from the beginning, I. We, we thought that the composition might be very similar, and we see the carbon dioxide on Venus is 96%. Look to Mars, 95%, and nitrogen, 3% for Venus, and 3% for Mars. Hmm, there is a clue on that? Yes, a huge clue. If we remove the, the carbon di dioxide from Earth's atmosphere, we will have the 3% on relative composition. That will be the 78 point something of nitrogen on Earth today. Wow. So, of course, oxygen is another story, but we, we had almost just uh, traces of CO2 at the time. So, the problem is the CO2 that was removed from the atmosphere on Earth and, of course, the take-home message is water, this history of water, and, of course, the greenhouse effect. So let's follow this lead in our investigation and see what happened with time to lead to this utter difference today. So, <clears throat> It's going, it's going, it's running. So this thing is connected with the moon and earth system. How come? Well, we know this for a long time. Most of you are thinking, we know about Theia collided, we call Theia to this impactor that collided with Earth, nothing new. Yes, there are something very new here. And what is new, it is new science that was published in Nature, but there are other uh, evidence about that, that the impactor, this is new, not coming in the books yet, this impactor was what we call uh, uh, ocean world. So like Europa, the moon, one of the moons of Jupiter, or Enceladus, another moon from Saturn, that brought this extra water to Earth that will, will be very important in the different temporal paths 
for us. So, if not, let's have a look on this. Plate tectonics. On Earth, we can see plate tectonics, but on Venus, no. Just one lid. How come? They are of the same size. They had more or less the same history, same density. What's the difference? Follow the water, we'd say Hitchcock. So let's follow the water and see the difference. Water uh, will work as a lubricant for the lays, as our colleagues that study the Earth uh, teach us. Perfect. Of course, that we have volcanic, uh, tectonic volcanism on Earth. Also, what I show here for Venus with chill volcanoes and hot spots, we also have on Earth. I know, like Hawaii passing by the, the, the lead over uh, uh, a hot, hot spot and we have the islands in a line with this motion. We know that. Another thing that is also important for this history is uh, looking to the <coughs> dynamo effect theory, so magnetic fields and the Faraday law. Again, perhaps you remember on that slide with a lot of numbers, but because we were a lot of numbers, I will assist to remind uh, you about the period, periodicity on the rotation rate for, for Venus. In, in Venus, it's so slow, it's almost, uh, almost tidally locked with the ro rotation around the sun. So one year on Venus is shorter than one day. So for the Faraday law that we need charged particles and speed, that will not work. So at least today, there is no evidence about an inner magnetic field on Venus, but also not on Mars. But Mars is much smaller, much smaller, mm, that's important. But another thing is that the rotation rate on Mars is almost, by coincidence, 24 hours, like on Earth. So Faraday, Faraday law might work. So what is the difference? Hmm, let's keep this in mind. It's connected with our research, and you will see on the next slides. But first, I also want to uh, connect the rotation rate with dynamics on the atmosphere. Of course, the fast rotators, let's say, like Earth and Mars, well, the uh, Coriolis acceleration is relevant, so we'll have these uh, anticyclonic and cyclonic, and so it's, it's not just that, it's more complicated, but today I will just give a simple approach. Now let's look to the slow rotators comparatively, like Venus and Titan, and what we see is that the atmosphere is in a super rotation, but huge phenomena of super rotation. For instance, on Venus, the atmosphere rotates 60 times faster than the solid globe. Wow. Okay, so dynamics are uh, a consequence, of course, of the rotation rate on the, of, the, of the planets, but also the magnetic fields, as we already pointed. But there is this open question about Mars that we will discuss. So first, regarding, regarding the dynamics, we started to develop and fine-tune high-resolution spectroscopy method, the uh, Doppler velocity technique, in order to tackle these dynamics uh, uh, issues. So we started to study Venus and both from the ground with high-resolution spectroscopy, but with coordinated observations also from space, so we have access to uh, ESA uh, space probes, but also from NASA, and we could uh, have these uh, several, uh, often I would say, coordinated observations that uh, proved to be highly uh, effective in, in also to, in, in the way to, to produce science and to understand things. So also, we also, uh, use a, a state-of-the-art cloud tracking technique that allows us to follow features on the clouds or differences in opacity in, in, the, in the atmosphere, as you can see here, for instance, you see there, beautiful hurricane on Venus in our observations. Wow. And with the rotation, it comes again. See? Well, this is on the night side, but we also perform the same thing with different wavelengths like the ultraviolet and others. And so we can, uh, because the optical uh, depth is different, 
It means, uh, as a function of the wavelength, that we can survey, we can sense different layers of the atmosphere and using ground-based and space-based observations coordinated, we can sense at the same time. So we can yield a 3D, uh, at least in the first approach, dynamic structure of the atmosphere. Also modeling for the dynamics is important. Here is one of our previous works regarding the Y-shape uh, global planetary scale uh, um, <coughs> wave on, on Venus that is known for 60 years or more and was not explained and we, with modeling we could, uh, uh, we could explain it as you can see. After we uh, started the collaboration with uh, Akatsuki Space Mission from Japan and using its particular orbit and sensors, we could uh, understand and discover and help to, to tackle these uh, global scale waves, as you can see in the infrared, in this, in this case, a stationary wave connected with the, the topography. And these, all these tools converge in order to uh, retrieve intense, uh, I, let's say, uh, high density uh, results from the last uh, year. And we have, for instance, a discovery of a major, like a wall, a major disruption on the atmosphere of Venus where the aerosols come up uh, and, and down. And is, this is really important. Also, something that is quite uh, relevant is if you see here, if you see my cur cursor here, oh, you don't see, so I will try point to point here, the meridional, the Hadley cell, meridional flow. There is just one cell on Venus due to a runaway greenhouse effect that led to these very, very high temperatures. On Earth now, we can see from re very recent papers that the Dudley cell is expanding in latitude. Could be connected with that? I think so. And that connects with some of the presentations that we saw here today. For instance, the, the effects on Portugal. Could be connected? Yes, I think so. So, not just uh, uh, with wind, but also studying atmospheric waves, because of course atmospheric waves transport energy and momentum and could be uh, relevant, for instance, for trigger and maintaining the super rotation process on Venus. So, on Venus, but we, uh, at this moment, we are studying th these atmospheric waves on Mars with different instruments from Mars Express, a, a space probe from ESA, but also on Venus. You can, can see here some of the, some examples of uh, atmospheric waves in different, uh, in different planets. Of course, here, we, for interpretation, we will be glad to discuss with our colleagues from Earth Exploration. So it's good to be in Sciences, where this is very easy to uh, discuss with ec experts on these uh, fields too. They, some of them are here in the room, so I will be knock on the door. <laughs> Another thing is uh, astrobiology, detection and characterization of chemical minor compounds with astrobiological interest. For instance, the historical uh, detection of methane on Mars, and so it's an ongoing detection by ExoMars and others. Uh, and on Venus, the, perhaps the claim of detection about phosphine, PH3, that could be a biomarker that is very, uh, very thrilling. We are in a direct collaboration with Clara Souza Silva in Harvard University, and we are using state-of-the-art uh, radiative transfer suites, for instance, like an emesis, with, in the framework of our collaboration with Patrick Ruin from Oxford. Uh, well, we, a key process, a key topic also in our group is atmosphere modeling to all these planets that we were discussing now, of course that we compare with Earth and also with the exoplanets that I will uh, tell you in a, in a minute. So this uh, research is, 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 is doing is my colleague Gabriela Gilli and uh, also with uh, Duke Irino. So here, with so many open questions about Venus, perhaps you were that three missions in a row were selected this year, two from NASA and one from European Space Agency, where uh, I'm uh, co-PI uh, 
of this new mission. So we are preparing one of our students from Ciencias, is now in Paris Observatory in a, in a co-supervised, uh, it's uh, at, from now is the uh, master, uh, with uh, Thomas Wiedemann, that is uh, PI of uh, Envision. Regarding Mars, well, regarding Mars, uh, Mars is very, do you remember this thing about the magnetic field? How come there is no magnetic field? You rotate fast. So the Faraday law is, is incorrect? No, no, I believe in physics totally. So what happened? You can see here the transformation of Mars losing the the northern uh, Mars, the, the northern sea, the Borealis Sea on the northern hemisphere with time, and so the transformation till be a desert, arid and dusty um, thing as we know today. Of course, that uh, we are we have some ongoing uh, research here, looking and trying to describe and interpret the old, the ancient shorelines of these. Uh, seas on, on Mars, but is the size of Mars. Because as we know from the uh, temperature diffusion equation, a, uh, a, a, a bread roll will cool down much faster than a bread from a lentejo. It's so simple as that. So he lost from the, and we can calculate easily the time to cool down, to lose the internal heat on Mars. And so the dy dynamo is not working well anymore. So it means that that explains the magnetic field that dropped down very fast and also no plate tectonic because the gradient of temperature is very low today. And also, of course, that is connected with no more water at surface on Mars. It's everything connected. We know on sciences, it, everything is connected. We must explore the, the strengths of these connections. So, of course, on Mars, there is some ices, there are seasons, but the dust is m the most important uh, factor in order to, to, to produce weather. As you can see, global dust storms can cover entirely the planet. So solar panels for a future settlement on, uh, of humans will be a problem. So we tackled this, uh, this uh, problem and we started to study uh, <coughs> um, the, the dust storms and we, we developed a, a technique in order to yield and maintain a world uh, planetary, I mean, planetary wind map along the um, along the dust storms. So finally, now the f new adventure, new steps. So we detected more than 4,400 exoplanets. For now, we start to detect and to see if they had atmosphere or not. And some tiny things extra. But from now we can, with the synergy of our observations and study of, uh, of the solar so system planets and atmospheres, we can perform and give uh, to our colleagues that characterize the atmospheres of the exoplanet some proxies, some templates to compare. For instance, the transmission spectroscopy on Venus transit. And because we know what we can get from the data and we, we know the observables from other uh, probes. Another thing is to look back to Earth from space. The real blue dot like the data from Rosetta that we have, looking back to Earth to see the impact of vegetation, of oceans, of clouds in a one pixel spectra on space. Yes, this is very important in this uh, collaboration with Ariel, a space mission that we are in preparation. I'm co-PI of the mission, as some of you know. And we, we are leading the working group of exactly of that, of, of the collaboration of the synergy between um, solar system atmospheres research and the atmosphere is one that is a new adventure that is just starting. We want to know from the exoplanets and to disentangle if they have, or have more or less the same size. We hear in the news, Earth type exoplanet. Come on, Earth, si Earth type, perhaps Venus type. 
And we will, I hope that in a new research day of science, I will say how we did it to discover this. We are now ongoing on this, uh, on this work to contribute with this. Perhaps we will see if we, at least is a big challenge. Of course, there are a lot of potentially habitable exoplanets, not habitability, this means just water at the surface or not. Habitable exoplanets, exoplanets, that's a new thing, but come on. There, that, that doesn't exist at such thing as a planet B. It's very simple. To reach the stars, to reach the, planet, the exploration of other planets needs a scale of time that is huge. We must buy this time. This is pure Darwin, pure natural selection. We just arrive to explore the other planets if, if we will be wise enough to take good care of our own planet. By the way, the most beautiful that I know. There is no such thing of planet B. We need to uh, have a re-encounter with our planet and uh, gain again some uh, uh, <coughs> symbiotic uh, relation with our planet. If we do that, one day, perhaps, we could arrive to these other planets. Thank you for your attention. And we have reached uh, the end of the presentations. Uh, we would like to thank all speakers and congratulate you for the work produced uh, that makes Ciencias Lisboa proud. We will now be closing the Ciencias Research Day 2021 with a few words from Professor Pedro Almeida. Good afternoon uh, to the ones I've not seen yet. Um, thank you for the introduction, Raquel. It's up to me to uh, complete this journey um, to the research day of Ciencias, and I would like to um, tell you that this was a day to celebrate research, uh, during which some of the best science produced at our school was on display, using complementary layers, from talks to posters, from lab visits to speed dates, with awards given to uh, researchers for the first time. And this is all a token of the engagement of our school towards research excellence. As we know, research stems from wonder and from curiosity. Wonder in face of the seemingly unexplainable and curiosity for the pleasure of finding the explanation. One of my dear masters, a teacher of this house once told me during one of the many chats we had along the years, you know, Pedro, research is in our essence. Today I was playing with my grandson and he was trying to discover how gravity works, dropping objects on the floor and observing the results. Some of those objects broke, of course, and so he found out that it was not a good idea to let them fall. As you have witnessed during this day, CNC here celebrates this curiosity in us preferably without breaking things. Always to further understand how to help mankind with newer knowledge, particularly in some of the most complex and threatening problems of our times. We want to congratulate all of those that in sciences and around the world embrace the commitment of being both curious and systematic, each day producing more and better science. We are also vividly aware that a society built upon the principles of science and technology needs to be better informed about science and to become an increasingly active part of the scientific effort. This is why we at Sciences are strongly committed to science communication, either actively re reaching for citizens and political stakeholders or inviting younger generations to visit us and share our sense of wonder about the unknown. Research is done for millennia. It is built, sorry, it has built our world as we know it. It will continue to surprise us. Seneca, a Roman philosopher from the first century once said, 
A time will come when enduring research will discover things that are today concealed. Many discoveries are reserved to the generations to come, when the memories of our own existence have faded, as nature does not reveal all its mysteries at the same time. At Sciences, we will continue to encourage curiosity, to encourage excellence research, and to empower society to be committed with science. It is a long haul project. We must succeed. Thank you for all of you that made this day possible, and we see you next year in Research 2022 at CSIR. Thank you all. Thank you.